Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition the following resolution of sympathy. Whereas Mr. Walter Bradley, former member of the Legislative Assembly for Second Kings from 1989 to 1996, passed away June 2nd, 2023. Therefore, be it resolved that this House re recognize the contributions made by the late Mr. Walter Bradley to this province. Honourable Deputy Premier. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Speaker. I wanted to rise to acknowledge the contributions of the late Walter Bradley, who represented the former riding at Second Kings from 1989 to 1996. Walter, a teacher for many years, who was vice principal and principal at Morrell Regional High School before first elected in 1989. Walter, former chair of the Morrell Village Commission and the member of the Morrell Legion and the Morrell Area Recreation Committee. An accomplished athlete in his youth, Walter was past president of the Baseball PEI Association. Walter served as Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries, Forestry, and the chair of the Canadian Council of Forest Ministers. Among the, uh, the district achievements, Walter oversaw the development of the Crowbush Golf Course, relocation of the Provincial Library, and the expansion to the park and parks in St. Peter's and the Morrell Legion. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the government, all members, I wish to offer my condolences to the family and friends of the late, late <coughs> Walter Bradley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I want to uh, start by uh, sending my condolences to the family of the late Walter Bradley. Um, the Deputy Speaker spoke of a lot of his accomplishments. He was very well known across the island for his interest in agriculture and fisheries and forestry, not only just because he was um, he was the head of the department, but he, he had a genuine interest in that and made many lifelong friends uh, through that journey. He also um, had a huge positive impact on many lives, both in the school system and his years of being a driving instructor with the uh, Morrell Driving School. So there's many people from the east and even from the Charlottetown area who have been in the car with him and share a few stories. I probably won't share any of them here today, but they've had some, some experiences with him. He was a very a, a kind, genuine man who um, was let's say, down to earth and uh, was willing to help everybody. Um, so the accomplishments that he had was mentioned by the Deputy Speaker, so I won't repeat them. Um, so on behalf of the official opposition, I would like to extend my deepest sympathy to his wife, Janet, his eight children, his grandchildren, and all his family. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, again, uh, I thank the Deputy Premier for outlining the work that uh, Mr. Bradley did in his community, both prior to his election and as the uh, member as the member for that, that area, um, particularly in his role as Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. Um, he was instrumental, as, as has been said, uh, in his community and establishing Crow Bush there and also moving the headquarters of the library to Morrell. Um, clearly a man who had his community in his heart and acted on that both as a, an elected member and in his ordinary life. And uh, I too want to send out my deepest sympathies to Janet and all of his family on behalf of the third party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I too would like to uh, send my condolences to the family. I knew Walter Bradley, as far back as I can remember, I, uh, I grew up playing baseball against his son, uh, Daryl, and uh, Walter was the coach of that Morrell team, and the team that I grew up on playing, playing on was probably the best team in the island, except for every second year, Walter had this, this team with Lefty Dunn and Steve McLean pitching that you know, they, they one hit us like, yeah, it was just, they were just so power, powerful. But Walter was a great competitor. Um, everyone looked up to him. Uh, Obviously, the, the people who played on, on both sides uh, grow to admire, admire him. I really admired Walter. He was a fantastic gentleman, and I hadn't seen him in a while, but I was at an event uh, a few years back in St. Peter's, and he called me over to sit with him, and I, I sat and got caught up with him. He's uh, always a gentleman, loved his area, loved uh, baseball, and loved people. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The 
Honorable Member for Morel Dona and the Deputy Speaker. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. It's, uh, it's an honour to get up and uh, speak about Walter. Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, the least of which uh, representing uh, the district that, that he represented, uh, but a, as a, a close friend uh, for many years. Um, uh, he, you know, as a lot of people know, uh, Second Kings, as it was, District 7 now, it has been uh, PC uh, the entire time, the last 70 years, except for the period when, uh, when, when, uh, when Walter was there. And I think that really speaks to the impact that he's had in the community. Um, uh, the, the previous members talked about the, uh, the, the baseball. Uh, he, was, he was the ultimate sports dad, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, figure skating especially. Uh, the ball field, uh, the rink, uh, him and his uh, son, the late uh, Daryl, as the, uh, the Minister of Environment had uh, spoke about, uh, were uh, were f uh, fantastic uh, coaches. Um, Madam Speaker, the the last couple of days, the uh, you know the sudden passing uh, ha has been awful, but it's it's brought up all kinds of, of wonderful stories, um, especially around uh, his years in in uh, in, in teaching. Uh, ironically, uh, when he was in politics was my period when I was in high school. So I, you know, I only had him for uh, in, in grade 12, actually, uh, uh, briefly. Uh, but years and years and years of, of stories, um, the, the part that keeps coming over and over again, um, when he was teaching, he always had the backs of his students, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, Standing up for, for student rights is, is pretty common right now, but even way back then, um, Walter Bradley had the backs of his students. He, he made he, you know he he was he was terse and and and, and upfront with them. You know you could always hear them calling him by the last name. He'd say you know like McEwen over here kind of thing. But you talk about someone that stood up for the students, stood up for the rights, stood against bullying, stood against anything that would go against. Uh, uh, you know he he made a connection with them all. He had a nickname of course for every student in the schools as well. Uh, the honorable, honorable Leader of the Opposition had talked about driver's ed, but I through the wake there yesterday, there was a ton of stories apparently, and, and uh, I didn't have him for a driver's ed teacher, but the, uh, the folks that were in the line were talking about, you know, just the impact that he had there, and, and as he said, everybody had a story about, about driver's ed as well. Um, really close uh, uh, with uh, Walter and, and Janet's children, of course, I, I, I grew up. Uh, with uh, Lana especially and Matthew were closer, but all of the children uh, have all gone on to do great things. So just my condolences to the entire family and to Janet as well. Uh, his impact in our community will be there forever. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Matters of privilege and recognition of guests, the Honorable Deputy Premier. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the gallery here today. And uh, as uh, Minister of Agriculture and uh, a farmer myself, Madam Speaker. Uh, my father used to say this was a million dollar rain, but I think we have to upgrade that to a billion dollar rain, Madam <laughs> Speaker. And uh, it's great to see that rain on the weekend. And Madam Speaker, uh, on the weekend, uh, the Dunstaff Niche Community Center had, had their uh, yearly fundraiser brunch, and uh, the young lady working the door, if you didn't recognize her, was my mother. And uh, she told me they raised $1,200 for the community center, so that was great. And finally, I want to congratulate the Island Student Athletes who were announced as recipients of the 2023 Sport PEI Scholarship. They are Lydia Inman from E. Cole St. Mary, Kale Hunter from Kensington Intermediate Senior High, Neely Johnson from Charlottetown Rural, Grayson Laporte from Bluefield High, and Trinity Roach from E. Cole LaBelle LeCole. And finally, Madam Speaker, I want to recognize that today is the 79th anniversary of D-Day, one of the most pivotal days of the Second World War. Many Islanders paid the ultimate sacrifice that day, and uh, so on behalf of everyone here, I want to offer the deepest thanks and gratitude to all our veterans. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I want to welcome everyone who's watching online and those who are in the gallery with us today. Uh, thank you for coming in. Um, today is a wet day. It's been a wet day all weekend, and as Mitch Cormier would say on CBC uh, Radio, the island really needed a drink, and uh, it, it certainly did. So it was welcomed for not only the agriculture sector, but also uh, for the forest. 
uh, we needed to put some some wetness on or some dampness on that. So, um, so it was much needed and much welcomed. So, last night, Madam Speaker, um, there was a uh, meeting at Westall Composite High School uh, organized by some concerned uh, residents of the area, plus the towns of Tignish, Alberton, and O'Leary. Um, it was a packed house. It was very nice to see the turnout. Um, there because residents are very, very concerned. I've mentioned in the House many, many times concerned about the future of healthcare, um, in particular in West Prince with uh, the ER closures and CE closures at Western Hospital and just what the future of healthcare looks like for the residents. So I want to thank the organizers and all of those who stood up to ask questions. Um, very, very good questions. Um, I or I should say I, they now understand my frustration of asking questions and not getting any answers. Um, that was clearly demonstrated last night. But I want to thank everyone for, uh, for coming out last night and participating in it. And uh, as they say, it's, it's not over yet. So um, we, we all do everything we can to secure timely access to health care in West Prince. Um, as the Deputy Premier uh, mentioned, yes, today is a a, um, the 79th anniversary of D-Day. It was the. Um, it was actually 1 p.m. our time today that um, Juno Beach was secured, and uh, that day our island, or Ireland, sorry, our forces moved inland, and two islanders were killed that day. Um, unfortunately, Private Ora William McEwen from Summerside and Lance Corporal Francis Morris of Charlottetown. So I too want to thank them and for everyone uh, for their service and keeping our country safe. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the House for another week of great debate here. And also everybody in the gallery. I see Eddie Childs is with us again. Eddie uh, is, was here last week, and Eddie is the president of the Students' Union at Holland College. And I suspect, though I don't know, but you have some of your colleagues with you from Holland College today. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm going to start by also talking about a little bit about D-Day, which was, happened 79 years ago today, June 6, 1944. And I say this because I have a very strong family connection. My grandfather, my mother's father, was a sea captain and was involved in the preparations for D-Day. And my mum used to tell the story, they lived in Swansea, Wales at the time, um, of my grandfather taking my mum up, up a hill behind the harbour and showing her all of the boats. That, well, that was one of the harbours from which the, the biggest amphibian uh, invasion in military history uh, left. And of course, he was absolutely sworn to secrecy, but uh, he wanted my mum to see this, uh, this unprecedented uh, time and collection of military boats that were about to head across the English Channel and um, to the beaches of Normandy. And my mum says that's, that's an, an image that's absolutely etched in her mind. So thank you to all of those who contributed to that, including the two islanders who lost their lives that day. Here on the island, um, about four or five years ago, I attended a, walk, uh, a talk at the Victoria Playhouse um, about what was at that time uh, just the germ of an idea, and that was the Island Walk. Um, it was uh, a talk being given by Bryson Guptill, and uh, four or five years later, I may be wrong on those dates, it's, everything is elastic these days, it could be a lot longer than that. But now, the Island Walk is established um, as a really critical part of our a, a tourism draw here to Prince Edward Island. And I, I think there are, as far as I can make out from the website, there's probably about 30 people currently soggily walking the island trail. Um, and throughout the summer and when the weather is, uh, is amenable, uh, people come from literally from all over the world to walk our island Camino here. And it was through the vision and the tenacity and the determination and the, and the ability of Bryson Guptill to gather people around and turn his dream into this reality uh, that we have the Island Walk today. So it's a really fantastic asset. It's all open. Most of it happens on public roads, but there are some places where um, it goes in the Con Confederation Trail, which of course is being cleaned up, and some, some other areas. So you can walk the entire length of the Island Walk now. Um, and uh, it's just a wonderful asset to have here in our province. So thank you, Bryson, for the work you did there, and everybody else who 
um, made that happen, including government that came forward with some sub substantial funding. And finally, I want to thank the uh, ITSS department, who have been struggling <laughs> since Friday, I think it was, when uh, there were some power surges that really disrupted the ability of uh, government to run its services here, or at least the online portion of it. And I know for us uh, in our office, we had intermittent issues with our internet, and you realize just how dependent you are on that, particularly when you're at work and, and trying to remain in communications with each other. So thank you to the ITSS folks who no doubt have had a very long, perhaps sleepless weekend. Um, still struggling, I understand. Um, it's not all fixed yet. But thank you for the work they do today and every day to uh, keep this incredibly important part of our lives up and running. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and welcome to everybody in the gallery today and everyone at home. Um, I'd like to um, offer my deepest condolences to our fellow MLA, Tyler DeRoche, um, his father, Daryl, his brother, Justin, and his sister, Tara, and their families, and all of the Arsenal family, on the passing of their mom, wife, and sister, Nooni Darash. Nooni was a friend of mine. Um, she'll be missed by many in the Summerside area. Thank you. Statements by members, beginning with the member from Surrey, Elmira. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's my pleasure to rise today to recognize our very own musical group, the East Pointers. Internationally acknowledged as musical trailblazers, the East Pointers are a multi-award winning East Coast pop and folk group with their roots deeply embedded in District 1, Surrey, Elmira. Madam Speaker, the band was originally comprised of fiddler Tim Jason, guitarist Jake Sharon, and the late Cody Jason. I will also add that each band member is multi-talented can play several instruments, and uh, as well as killer vocals. The East Pointers recently won three ECMA awards for their album, House of Dreams, including Pop Recording of the Year, Group Recording of the Year, and Contemporary Roots Recording of the Year. Madam Speaker, Cody Jason was Tim's bandmate and cousin, and sadly passed away suddenly at home in January 2022. All seven tracks on the album, House of Dreams, were written and recorded with Cody before he passed. Finishing and releasing the album was a way to honor Cody's legacy. And Madam Speaker, I know Cody sure would be proud. The East Coast Music Awards is a regional collaboration of people in the music industry in Atlantic Canada that develops and celebrates East Coast artists locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. So I just want to say congratulations to the East Pointers on this uh, incredible achievement. And on behalf of all of us here in the House and all Islanders, you make us very proud. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Kensington Malpeck and the Government House Leader. Madam Speaker, I rise today to highlight a few constituent achievements. Firstly, I want to recognize a friend of PEI. Kirsten Neuschaefer on winning the Golden Globe Retro Circumnavigation Race last month. Kirsten spent almost a year working to refit her yacht called Miniaha in Darren Cousins' workshop in Darnley with shipwright Eddie Arsenal. Mm -hmm. The so solo global cir circumnavigation yacht race took, here, took her eight months to complete. She is the third winner of the Golden Globe Race and the first woman to ever win a solo circumnavigation yacht race. Congratulations, Kirsten, on this extraordinary achievement. The next constituent I want to recognize is Braden Crothers. Braden Crothers is a senior member of the Kensington 4-H Club who recently received first place in the senior public speaking category and also received the Marlene McDonald Top Senior Speaker Award. For the past 45 years, the Marlene McDonald Award has presented to top, the top provincial senior speaker at the provincial 4-H competition. Congratulations on these awards, Braden. Finally, I want to recognize Cale Hunter on signing his intent to play for the UNB Reds men's soccer team for the 2023 Atlantic University Sports Campaign. He'll be majoring in biology at UNB with intentions to become an optometrist. Cale attends Kish and is known for his coachability, great character, and strong work ethic. 
Gale has been the captain of both PEI FC's under-17 Nova Scotia Soccer League team, as well as at the under-17 National Championships. He has been awarded the 2023 under-18 AAA top goaltender with the Mid-Isle Matrix. In addition, he was recently awarded a 2023 Sports PEI Scholarship for achievement in sports, the classroom, and community. Congratulations, Kale. You certainly have a bright future ahead of you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, today I'd like to recognize Grand River Ranch. Grand River Ranch is an equine therapy program offered to all abilities. It has been in operation for seven years and has grown to employ 11 people. Most of the participants are referred by the province's accessibility support program. Each week, nearly 70 people, both youth and adult, attend the ranch where programs are facilitated by the owner, a registered social worker who is a certified instructor of riders with disabilities through the Certified Horsemanship Association and a facilitator of the equine assistant learning. Heather Blowen's team of key players consist of certified instructors, a retired counselor, human services graduates, as well as residential care workers and those who have been in the horse industry for decades. They have a brand new facility with an indoor riding arena and fully accessible kitchen and washroom, which was designed to be as universally friendly as possible after consult with resource abilities professionals. Grand River Ranch has a strength-based uh, philosophy where each participant has something to offer and feels value and included for their uniqueness. The research on the benefit horses have on people was endless, and Heather extends an invite for those interested in learning more to attend her ranch to experience the magic for themselves. Currently, there is a film crew there, there this week doing the documentary, documentary on her programs. Congratulations to Grand River Ranch for recently being recognized for a province-wide award on being the most inclusive employer. Thank you to Heather and her crew for the valuable work that you do. Questions by members, beginning with questions, responses to questions taken as notice. The Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We've heard time and time again that staffing is the biggest challenge in our health care system. The Minister has stood in this House and stated this time and time again, staffing, staffing, staffing. So this week, and every week moving forward, I'll be opening my questions with the same question. Question to the Minister. How many healthcare staff, including LPNs, RNs, NPs and doctors, were hired in the past week? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, it is a great question. I have talked to the Department about a monthly update uh, on our recruitment and hiring efforts. So I guess we could push that back to a, to a weekly update, but I think it's fair. Um, I share, I share the, uh, the members' uh, sense of urgency in what we do. This is hiring season uh, as our graduates uh, fulfill their programs. So um, I think it is reasonable to ask for a timely update. Um, again, I think weekly may be, may be, at certain times of the year, may be appropriate, but other times maybe not. But I do agree with the premise of the question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So now we're into the first week of June. So question to the Minister. How many health care staff, including LPNs, RNs, NPs and doctors, were hired in the past month? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I do know, and just in a conversation with regards to the nursing program at UPEI, that we had 39 hires from that graduating class, and I believe at the time we had about eight outstanding offers, so I haven't had an update from that point um, since that's just kind of casual conversation, but I can assure you that um, we are doing some hiring. The Premier re uh, referenced the 17 new paramedic hires, so I can assure you that we are doing everything we can to hire health care professionals. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last night, there was a public meeting held in Elmsdale on the topic of joint collaboration on emergency health services in West Prince. Invitations were sent to a list of officials, including the Premier, Minister of Health, the Minister of Transportation, myself and Dr. Garnham at Health PEI. Now, first, I want to thank the organizers, the towns of Alberton, O'Leary and Tignish. Uh, close to 500 people attended to ask questions, express their feelings and be heard by people who can actually make a difference. 
Question to the Minister of Health. Do you feel last night's meeting was a productive use of your time? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, absolutely, I think it's important to connect with our communities, um, to advise them of some of our efforts. efforts. Uh, I think they used the word yeah, the words fight and save last night. I, I kind of disagree with those terms. We do not want to fight with anybody. There is no saving to be done. Those are important facilities. We value them. We want to staff them. So again, I appreciate the time um, that they took. Um, it was very beneficial for us uh, to hear those concerns, and, and we do appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, so attendees oh, were very concerned over the state state of health care in rural PEI. Noticeably, concerns were voiced about miscommunication coming from health PEI, closure of the rural hospitals, NDR, lack of access to primary care, and frustration with this government continually stating that health care is facing challenges right across this country. Question to the Minister. Now that you have heard firsthand the concerns about the state of health care in rural PEI, will you finally get on with the business of creating solutions instead of offering excuses for your, your and health PEI's failure to adequately meet the health care needs of rural islanders? Governor Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, it's just not um, rural health care that we're focusing on. We're focused on the entire system, and, and again, we understand that there's challenges there. Um, I think you'll see in the budget with the 15% increase uh, in, in services uh, in health care that we're going to uh, improve uh, talent acquisition. We are going to invest in primary access clinics. Uh, again, we'll continue on with the Pharmacy Plus program. I think you'll see a uh, full scope of practice in order to add PAs and NPs to um, our, our suite of, of health care professionals. And we're also doing a lot to remove hurdles for licensing and movement um, of our physicians and health care workers. Thank you, ma'am. Leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. But what we are seeing, we're not seeing any forward movement here. We're seeing this stuff backwards, actually. So this meeting was organized by concerned volunteers. The residents of West Prince and the communities themselves were all involved. They had no help from this government and zero assistance from Health PEI. Mm -hmm. In fact, the CEO of Health PEI even requested that the date of the meeting be moved, despite the fact that more than a, a month's notice was given to them. So question to the Minister. When it comes to health care and responding to the needs of residents, why does your government continue to react as opposed to being proactive in working with the affected communities and residents of West Prince? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, our government is being proactive. I think if you look at our platform from the previous election, I think it's from page 5 to page 16, there's an extensive list of issues there. Um, it is a marathon. I will acknowledge that. And we need to run from telephone pole to telephone pole. There's a lot of issues that we need to, to knock down in order to move the system forward. It's been, it's been challenged for years, and we understand that. So there's a, a litany of lists of, of, of issues that we have already taken um, action with, and, there's, uh, and the list continues. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm a leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, if I do look at that past uh, platform for the previous election, um, you'll notice shovels in the ground. So we have yet to see shovels in the ground. And you know exactly what we're meaning about that and Islanders do. So, Madam Speaker, miscommunications, specifically the miscommunications coming from Health PEI and its CEO, was highlighted as a major concern last night. Residents felt that they were ignored, as if they were being told one thing from folks who are 10,000 feet above while seeing a whole other reality playing out before them on the ground when it comes to health care. So question to the Minister, will you finally stand up for Islanders and insist that Health PEI review its approach to communications with rural Islanders so that we can finally get everyone on the same page? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I do understand the question. I do uh, absolutely understand people's frustration, and they do direct it at myself and, and the CEO of, of Health PEI. That is very understandable. I guess that's the roles we chose um, in representing the health system. But as to the meeting last night, we did have, I think, eight officials from Health PEI there. There's a big, large team that manages our health care system of 6,500 employees and 65 facilities. So I do understand their frustration with, with us. And again, I, I, it's not on deaf ears. There's hardworking people that were there last night and hardworking people in both our department and Health PEI. And I can assure you that they're working as hard as possible to, again, knock off all these issues that will help us move forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Leader of the 
the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And yes, there were many last night from the Department of Health and from, from Health PEI. Uh, I, they must have board the big blue bus and, and all got in and they came up there, but there's, it was quite a, quite a display to see when they scrambled to answer questions like, who's going to answer this? You're going to answer this? You're going to answer this? Anyway, it was quite a display. So, Madam Speaker, while my questions today have been directed to the Minister of Health, it's hard to imagine that the other members of Government Caucus haven't expressed their frustrations. Um, I know their constituents are expressing uh, with Health PEI on this matter, so specifically the Minister of Transportation from Alberton, the Minister of Economic Development from Escush, the Minister of Social Development uh, from Summerside, the members from District uh, 23. So questions to the Minister of Health. Can you tell the House how many times these ministers and members have brought forward concerns about rural health care and health PEI from their constituents and what did you, what did you tell them to do about it? General Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And again, back to reference the meeting last night, again, it was it was heated at best, um, but again, if I compare to our own uh, members, they, they are the strongest advocates, I think, of, of anybody in this House. They are uh, continually push me and, and the Department for answers on what we're doing. So uh, I, in, in a nice, respectful way, um, they, I try to ask for solutions from them. But again, they are huge advocates for their districts. I can't say enough about all of them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So, Madam Speaker, despite more than a month's notice, neither the Premier nor the CEO of Health PEI were in attendance at the meeting last night. When the Premier of the province refuses to meet face-to-face -face with affected islanders, it shows a lack of leadership. Question to the Minister of Health. Did the Premier inform you about his decision not to attend last night's meeting in advance, and what was his reason for declining the invitation? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do disagree with the timelines. I don't have it exactly, but I do not believe it was a month. Um, I think it was in the seven to, ta seven to ten day range. Um, both uh, Dr. Gardam and the Premier are at a province, and it's unfortunate. As I stated at the meeting last night, we did respond to the organizers and suggested the following Monday. And unfortunately, they wouldn't. They didn't want to change the date, and we understand that. So that's why we provided other people from Health PEI, and we, and we participated in the meeting. Thank you, Madam Speaker. General Leader of the Opposition. So, Madam Speaker, that just shows no consideration. There was no response from the Premier whether he was going to attend or not. There was no acknowledgement. There was no concern. There was no respect to those who organized it. No respect to West Prince residents. So, Madam Speaker, last night when questioned, the Minister of Transportation from Alberton reaffirmed his commitment to keeping the Western Hospital open, including 24-7 emergency services. I want to take a moment and thank the Minister for his uh, commitment and clarity in the topic. But a question to the Minister of Transportation. Will you reaffirm that commitment here in the provincial legislature? The Honourable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. And uh, yes, I will uh, reconfirm exactly what I said and is on the record from last night, Madam Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that. Uh, Madam Speaker, we have uh, heard time and time again that physicians who depart are given the opportunity to conduct an exit interview, but this process is voluntary, not mandated. Further, we have heard directly from doctors that they are not permitted to speak out about why they are leaving our province. Question to the Minister. Why are exit interviews for physicians not mandatory, and why are doctors not permitted to speak out on why they are leaving our province? Is this a gag order or a result of health PEI's policy and will you commit to reversing this practice of secrecy and enforce silence so that we can hear firsthand while doctors are leaving our province in droves. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you Madam Speaker. Um, I think it's important to, to note is that I think it's important for us to have stay interviews. I think we talk to our doctors all the time and as I stated at the meeting last night is um, when a doctor leaves, um, it, it's not sudden news. Um, we have ongoing conversations with those doctors, and it could be scope of practice, it could be family issues, um, it could be they're looking for a different educational opportunity. So we are speaking to our doctors. I, I, I can't reinforce that enough. And again, not all doctors who leave Prince Edward Island are leaving because of our health system. There's lots of reasons why people move around from any job to job, so I think it's important to recognize that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, well, the doctors that I speak to are leaving primarily because of though they don't have the supports and the resources, they're overworked, um, the demands from health PEI are too great, and they're overwhelmed. Um, so the CEO of Health PI wasn't in attendance despite more than a month's notice in this meeting. Instead, he sent others in his place. And apparently, he and the Premier both share a lack of urgency on this topic of rural health care and the courage to face affected islanders. So, question to the Minister of Health. From what you heard last night, would you say that islanders, especially those in rural Prince Edward Island, have faith in the CEO of Health PEI to do what is needed to save rural health care and to communicate openly and transparently with them on topics that affect them? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I do agree that we need to communicate as, as best we can in health care, and it's important. I think sometimes, um, especially with the Division of uh, Health and Wellness and Health PEI, that uh, we could be a little bit more coordinated in some of our messaging. It, it's, it's a symptom of what, we, uh, what government did in separating those departments. So again, I think it's important to communicate um, as best we can for for everything, and that includes bad news and good news. I think there is a, uh, sometimes we don't uh, explain to people some of the new initiatives that we have as well. I'll use Pharmacy Plus as an example. I do get emails from time to time and, and from, um, with regards to access to primary care, and some of them are, simple, are, are prescription renewals, so those are easy plans, but I would say to the department we need to do a better job of increasing awareness of some of the programs that we do have. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Well, I can tell you, um, I heard last night loud and clear that West Prince residents do not have faith in the CEO of Health PEI. And I don't know why your go-to for every question is Pharmacy Plus. It is a great program, but it doesn't have to be your response to every question I ask. So, Madam Speaker, like I said, the CEO of Health PEI was not in attendance last night, despite more than a month's notice being given. So, question to the Minister of Health. Do you stand by and support your CEO of Health PEI, or will you finally side with Islanders? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I, I guess I want to uh, reaffirm again, back to my previous statement, that I understand people's frustration with both um, the Department of Health and Wellness and Health PEI. Um, it is a big system that we, we task uh, the CEO, but he's part uh, of a team. Um, with reference to him not showing up, uh, I did receive a text, and I think I should table it. It was May 26 that we were invited to this to this town hall meeting, and I don't think that's a real big point here. Um, again, we did offer a, a date because both um, Dr. Gardam and the Premier were at a province, and that's just the way it is with scheduling. So we did offer another date. Uh, we wanted to participate, but again, the, the organizers didn't feel that, that it was appropriate, and I understand that. So again, we, we brought a full team of health PEI uh, to answer those questions, and even back to his comment about who was to answer, probably Dr. Gardam would have a better encompassing view, but I think all of the members that were there took a piece of, of, of a particular question under their authority and answered it correctly. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, Madam Speaker, I'm not sure right now what could be more important to West Prince residents and their health care. So a question to the, uh, you know, Madam Speaker, it's clear that the, the, the deputy, or sorry, the minister is overwhelmed in this topic and his frustrations are heard, you know, we hear it from Islanders Red right Cross. So question to the deputy premier, does your government continue to stand by and support the CEO of Health PI, or will you finally say enough is enough and take the necessary steps to ensure rural Islanders have access to the health care that they deserve? The Honourable Deputy Premier. Appreciate the question, and uh, Madam Speaker, I, as I listen to our, the Minister of Health and Wellness here today, to uh, just all the challenges that uh, his department is facing, and uh, we will work together to ensure that rural health care is stable and supported throughout this island for the years to come. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. Over the weekend, a number of parents, students, and residents received a two-page hate flyer from an anonymous coward on the topic of sexual education and parents' rights. The letter opposed trans rights. The letter demanded that our island educators inform parents if children are questioning their gender identity. This hateful flyer, which were filled with misinformation and outrageous comments, also suggested that island educators were not up to the task of conducting age-appropriate sexual education. Question to the Minister of Education in early years. When were you made aware of these flyers being circulated? Minister of Education, early years, and Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Last week, I would have been made aware of them. I believe they started circulating 
mid to late last week, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Honorable Leader from Charlottetown West Royalty. Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. These flyers are being distributed without any regard for recipients, placed on windshields in public spaces, dropped off in mailboxes. People in both rural and urban areas had these flyers pushed on them by anonymous cowards. Question to the Minister. Have you or your department conducted an outreach to parents, families, or schools to get an estimate of how many of these brochures were received by families of students? Honorable Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, certainly our, our education staff, um, we continue to strive to ensure our schools are safe and respectful learning environments for all. Um, I've had a number of discussions with um, staff regarding these flyers. We are concerned about the flyers. We want our students to feel safe. We do, however, recognize it's, uh, it is uh, up to a student um, whether or not they participate in a school activity, Madam Speaker. Um, but through my time as Minister, I hope I've proven that I am there to support um, all of our students and staff, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, the public school branch and the Minister of Education both declined interviews on this topic, stating that they didn't want to give more airtime to this brochure and the publisher. But Madam Speaker, I can tell you for a fact that remaining silent in the face of hate is not the right decision. Hate like this must be called out every time. The community under attack deserves reassurance from the government that nothing like this will happen, but what happened in New Brunswick will happen here. They expect government to stand strong and express your support. Uh, you, you have a duty as Minister to stand up in person to reassure all Islanders that you support our transgender community and our island students and families who have been targeted by this brochure. Question to the Minister. I'll give you a chance to do what, what I, I think um, should have been done already. Will you stand up and first denounce and condemn this brochure and second state your full and unwavering support for the transgender community and our transgender students, parents and educators? Young Minister of uh, Education Early Years. I, uh, I've been the Minister of Education for the last two and a half years and um, certainly the topic of gender and diversity has um, come up on a daily basis and, and as it should, we, it's important that we continue to support our school communities and each day as I am in this role, I endeavor to ensure that again, all of our schools feel safe, they feel supported. Um, Madam Speaker, it was in 2021 after extensive consultation that we, um, we uh, announced the uh, gender and diversity guidelines, Madam Speaker. Again, want to ensure that those students do feel safe and supported. We'd off we've offered a number of different uh, training opportunities for our staff. I know our staff in education are um, working diligently, again, to make sure that our schools are safe places where kids can come to to feel safe and respected. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Much, Madam Speaker. Uh, this weekend, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital sent out a public advisory about their ER being over capacity and wait times being even longer than usual. The same day, I received an, e an email from someone whose father recently had a stroke. He had drooping on his right side. He had slurred speech, all of the, all of the symptoms of a stroke. And the family knew that time was of the essence, and they immediately took him to the ER at 11 a.m. At 3.40 that afternoon, after not seeing a doctor, there was an announcement over the Tanai that said no one here would be seen until at least 10 p.m. They then took their father home, staying up with him all night, recognizing that he could be, very well be having lasting damage to his brain. Luckily, this story ended with happily, and the next day their father was seen by a general practitioner, and he's expected to make a full recovery. There are many factors that contribute to this dangerous situation, but one underlying cause is a system that has not adapted to the rapidly growing population of our island. A question to the Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. There is no sign that this government is taking its foot off the gas when it comes to population growth. Are you concerned about the unintended consequences of your government's policy and how it is impacting healthcare, potentially putting islanders' lives at risk? 
Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honorable Member for the question. Um, I do want to state that this government cares deeply about the population uh, growth on the island, and we are uh, currently just putting some final touches on the population strategy. And, and the, I realize it's taken a length of time to get there. I do think that there needs to be some processes. It's not how fast we get it out. It's to ensure that it actually meets a whole government approach, such as uh, finding ways to ensure that we have enough um, you know, supports in our health system, we have enough supports in our education, we have enough housing to support that. Um, I firmly believe that we need to really take a look at that whole government approach to ensure that we are being successful in, in ensuring that those that are accessing services have the ability to do so. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party for Supplementary. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think in all of the instances that the Minister just mentioned, the data would tell us that we are failing and that Islanders are not able to reach those critical services. We know that our province has a housing crisis, for example, with availability and affordability worse than at any other time in our history. We also know that we must build 2,000 new housing units every year just to keep up with the projected population growth, something that we're not even close to doing currently. The situation is bad and it's going to get worse thanks to the same aggressive population strategy of this government. To the same minister, at what point do you as Minister responsible for population, raise alarm bells and demand a review of this strategy. The Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. Um, as I just mentioned, there is a, a new uh, strategy coming, so, uh, and we've certainly taken a harder look at you know, all of the needs of this whole entire government, including housing, uh, and beginning those, you know, having great conversations with stakeholders at play, such as the Construction Association, and, and including you know, our institutions and when our post-secondary, when students are going out and ensuring they're making that pathway to those uh, careers to help with uh, that growth on PEI. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party, your second supplementary. I wish your government would also spend time speaking to folks like the students from uh, Holland College who are suffering in housing insecurity in utter unprecedented numbers these days. Whether it's a crumbling health system, islanders forced into housing insecurity, loss of farmland or inadequate childcare spaces, the record population growth our province has experienced is impacting so many critical areas of our lives. And let me be clear. The problem here is not newcomers to the island. In fact, the newcomers are often the most impacted by these issues. The problem is an inept government that fails to plan properly and chases the economic growth that comes from bigger populations without investing in the infrastructure required to support it. To the same minister, why can't this government figure this out? and invest properly so that all islanders, whether you've been here for six weeks or six generations, are not placed in perilous situations because of this short-sighted policy. The Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, and I just want to clarify uh, my commitment to post-secondary students. And, and I've had the opportunity to have a very brief conversation with our new student union president who is here in the gallery today. Uh, and we'll continue those conversations to ensure that we hear about those direct challenges for students within those post-secondary institutions. I have spent many, many years working with students. And I am very passionate to ensure that they have what they need uh, to continue their education, including where they need to be able to stay. I am fully aware that residencies has been issue uh, and I will continue to com communicate with our post-secondary institutions to find out their path there uh, and we'll continue to work through our, po our population strategy to ensure that we are making headway and progress on ensuring that those coming here will have housing opportunities uh, to stay and, and make PEI their home. Thank you. I'm a member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have been hearing from small business owners and not-for-profits who are struggling uh, with landlords not holding up their end of rental agreements. Things like not turning on heat, not fixing holes in the roof, or resulting in customers or clients being greeted on rainy days with leaky roofs and buckets catching the water on the floor. This has been demoralizing to small business owners and not-for-profits and scaring away customers and clients. Question to the Minister of Justice. What recourse is available to small businesses and not-for-profits when landlords do not hold up their end of the rental agreement? Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, the member across raises uh, some uh, legitimate concerns and issues that are, our small businesses are facing. And uh, uh, there is an appeal process through IRAC, but uh, 
if there's uh, specific information, I'll bring it back uh, to this house uh, on some more detail. Thank you. <clears throat> Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, your first supplementary. Thank you. Landlord and Tenant Act, which applies to commercial tenancies on PEI, was proclaimed in 1989, but has not been fully reviewed. In the meantime, the Uniform Law Conference of Canada has developed a model Commercial Tenancies Act to promote a modernized and consistent le legislative framework from province to province. Will the Minister of Justice commit to a full review of our commercial tenancy legislation to ensure that small businesses and not-for-profits and jobs are protected? Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for the member uh, across for that question, and absolutely, and I'd love to sit down with you, and we'll address that and try to uh, come to a resolution on this so it can, uh, we can help our small businesses in, in, in these situations. Thank you. Honourable Member from Charlton, Victoria Park, your second supplementary. Well, thank you. While we're waiting for modernized commercial tenancy legislation, we need to do more to protect small businesses and not-for-profits who are at risk. During the election, I heard from a number of small businesses who were worried about potential rent increases they could not afford. Can the Minister of Finance explain what we will find in this budget to ensure the small businesses and not-for-profits are supported as they face rising rents? The Honourable uh, Minister of Finance. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, on our end, we um, keep those communication lines open um, with small businesses, especially through the Chamber of Commerce's would be one stakeholder that we would engage with and have open conversations with over time. Um, uh, that would be one chain, but absolutely, I, I would be open to sit down with any of those stakeholders at any time and try to help them through any challenges they might be facing. Time, barely oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. One of the challenges the governments face when often delivering programs is that inflation, cost of living, and other factors can push that help out of reach. Question to the Minister of Social Development. How often does the government review the eligibility thresholds to qualify for government programs? The Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam, Senior, or Madam, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the Honourable Member for that um, question. <laughs> um, there, uh, there are certainly some wonderful programs out there, and I do believe there are some challenges, and uh, the thresholds are reviewed every year. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. One thing I hear about is that when there's a boost for funding for a program or service, that it may push a person out of being able to qualify for a program elsewhere. This isn't an issue exclusive to the provincial government because sometimes when federal programs are boosted too. Question to the Minister of Social Development. Is this something that you can raise with your federal counterparts so that residents aren't disadvantaged? The Honourable Minister of Social Development Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> Well, we certainly want to ensure that ensure that all programs are available and they're easy, accessible, you know, for, for the folks out there. And, and so this department would be willing to um, work with the other level of government to uh, find out what, what can take place. But one thing I do know is that government departments work together, that this isn't a concern for the, par the departments within the provincial government. And uh, we'd have to look at it and see what we could do. Thank you. The Honourable Member from Ch Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This is an ongoing problem that is, re that is really just a series of unintended consequences, but at the end of the day, it's still leaving some islanders unable to get the help that they need. Question to the Minister of Finance. Will you commit to having your department take a look at the program el eligibility thresholds for our provincial program so that islanders aren't caught up in this situation? The Honourable Minister of Finance. Um, with regards to um, the payments, um, like for example, the inflationary payments that were um, put out, I think it was July last year and again in January. Um, from the finance perspective, those, those inflationary, inflationary payments that went out were um, um, non-taxable, or they, they weren't, you know, they, they weren't going against uh, the taxable income. 
So on the finance side, that's done, and that was because it was captured within um, the sales tax piece payouts. Um, as far as the thresholds go, I think that that, you know, we can we can look at ours for sure, but each department's going to have to look at their own thresholds, and I think that's the way it has to be done. But I'll take it under advisement. Thank you. Gentleman <laughs> member from Rustico Emerald. Madam Speaker, so Madam Speaker, traffic safety is becoming a bigger and bigger issue in our communities uh, due to increase in population, um, lots and lots of tourism traffic, which is a good thing, but it, it really stresses uh, the traffic, the roads is in particular, and of course there's a lack of police services. And then couple couple that with the active transportation initiatives where we're bringing more cyclists and pedestrians on the road. Uh, you know, growing communities, for example, the town of North Rustico, need a formal evaluation and strategy to ensure their roads remain safe and get safer. A question to the Minister of Transportation. Uh, what measures are you taking to improve traffic safety in our communities? Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, certainly a great question. Uh, absolutely, as our population increases, uh, of use of, uh, of vehicles on our roads increases. Uh, highway safety always has to be paramount uh, uh, with uh, my department and certainly right across government, Madam Speaker. And uh, with regard to some of the measures that have been taken, one of the things uh, that was uh, approved uh, actually last fall here in the legislature was an amendment to the Highway Safety Act that will allow for the use of photo radar and red light. And I have to give credit to, Madam Speaker, to the Federation of Municipalities and our police agencies for advocating for this. Thank you. Honourable Member from Risto Emerald for a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And the, uh, the Honourable Minister, I think, read my mind, Madam Speaker, oh. because it's something I've been advocating for for years here in the legislature, and it's great to see those changes in, pl in place. <laughs> because, I mean, those traffic violations are at the root of, of what, uh, if we can stop them, we can make our roads uh, safe. And so photo radar devices detect the speed of moving vehicles, take pictures of the license plate, and send a ticket if the driver is going too fast. So. I guess uh, my question to the minister is because I don't see any photo radar implemented yet. You know, what is the status of photo photo radar implementation in PEI? Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. And again, uh, to the honourable member, uh, a great question, really. As I had mentioned, the uh, Highway Traffic Act was amended last fall. Uh, my department, together with the Department of Justice, are presently working on the regulations. And uh, uh, I'm not going to give an exact date, but certainly we need to have that put in place as soon as possible, Madam Speaker. Thank you. So, Madam Speaker, uh, I, I think that we've seen in the jurisdictions that have implemented fo photo radar across Canada that really it's it's efficient, it's effective, and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, Madam Speaker, really, I, I don't know what the delay is all about. We've got the legislation in place. We're ready to go. We've waited for years for this, and and I'd, I I was this is a question to the Minister of Transportation. Um, will you commit to coming up with a plan and a date when you will implement photo radar on Prince Edward Island? General Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, certainly, uh, Madam Speaker, I will go back to the Department in conjunction with the Minister of Justice, see if we can uh, provide uh, the legislature here with an exact date or at least a, a close time frame. Uh, with that, Madam Speaker, too, though, I think what we need to look at some of the other actions that our government has taken to address things like uh, photo radar, uh, like uh, certainly red light more in our municipalities, but things that we have taken uh, on our, our roadways uh, to address excessive speeding, Madam Speaker, and certainly some of the, the increase in the fine structures that we've seen there. Uh, this government has taken action, will take action, Madam well, Speaker, to address yeah. this. Thank you very much. The Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, in the wake of uh, Hurricane Fiona, this government has committed to investing $1 million into tree planting and hitting a goal of planting 1.3 million trees per year. And speaking with a forestry contractor recently, I uh, hear tree planting has been cut. One contractor uh, says that uh, they've been cut back 100,000 seedlings a year west of Kensington. 
We know Fiona took a considerable amount of trees from across PEI. Storms of this magnitude do impact climate change, and trees provide us with a carbon uh, storage system. Question to the Minister of Environment. How many trees are we planting in 2023 west of Kensington, and how many are going to plant in that area out of the 1.3 million? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, we don't have it broken down into west of Kensington, unfortunately. <laughs> so certain the, the measures that we would have. But what I will sell, tell the honourable member is, obviously we have a lot of pressure on trees right now. We only have a, a nursery that can grow so many. Part of the funding we announced yesterday is to uh, increase our capacity and what we can grow for seedlings. Um, so we're, we're getting pulled in all different directions. I have asked the staff, is there an off-island source that we can that we can take in that won't interfere with the natural species that we have here in Prince Edward Island? I'm waiting to hear back on what that could look like, if that's a possibility, uh, so that we can do even more. We know we have a lot down. We know we have a lot to replace, and we know we want to do everything we can do to replace them. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, it's good that the minister is looking at ways to find more trees here, but I happen to not only talk with a contractor, but I also talked with a forestry technician in Western PEI. And he told me that he has requests for landowners of 40,000 trees that he can't access from the department, simply can't get the trees. Pretty unacceptable. Where's all these trees? 1.3 million trees, you can't find 40,000? <laughs> uh, it certainly tells me there's a lot of miscommunication in government, uh, Madam Speaker. And, uh, and I'm wondering, is there any risk if you're going to import trees from other provinces? What provinces are you going to be uh, bringing these trees in from? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. So I'll carefully try to answer that question again. Uh, Forty percent of our forest was knocked down, so we have tree requests all across Prince Edward Island. So you can find a, a forester anywhere on Prince Edward Island that's going to tell you the exact same story that they can't get the trees, which is why we're trying to see if there's a source elsewhere where, where we can bring trees in because we think it's important to um, make this happen really quickly. When we increase our capacity to grow trees, uh, that's going to make a, a large impact, and that's a permanent fixture that we'll have. We'll have a new greenhouse that's bigger than the, our current one that will give us the ability to grow even more trees, and we'll grow those to full capacity each and every year. So there's going to be years down the road where we're going to be begging the same contractor to take trees, and he's probably going to be telling us no, but we're going to make him take them to plant them anyways. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Madam Speaker, it is good that we're looking at expanding our nursery, but we also mean that we're going to have to expand our staffing to, to complement that. But, uh, you know, I think it's really important that we start to maybe work out a plan with maybe another province, Mr. Or Madam Speaker, regarding that uh, maybe in future we'll provide you with some trees uh, and uh, you give us some right now because Hurricane Fiona did hit us in Nova Scotia much more severely. Uh, Minister, have you informed the PEI Woodlot Association of the lack of availability of trees so they're well informed of, uh, and are able to prepare for uh, the shortcoming in trees? General Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. So, yeah, I think it's pretty common uh, knowledge inside the industry that we're, we're short of trees. I mean, we didn't anticipate needing to grow as many many trees as, as we need, and we didn't own the ability to grow any more than what our greenhouse would grow. We've been working with the federal government for uh, a period of time now to get in line to have the funding that we announced yesterday so that we can access dollars to help us grow our capacity. So when we grow our capacity, we'll have more trees. We know it's important. It was important before Fiona. We were trying to increase the number of trees we planted before Fiona, um, so it's even more important afterwards. But on the staffing thing, I'll hire as many people as you can give me. Thank you, Madam oh. Speaker. This minister is just full of good Final news. He's going to solve every problem, uh, Madam Speaker. But once again, we always hear the bravado over there about all these trees we're going to plant, and now we're seeing that trees are being cut. Uh, minister, can you inform, is, is this the tree cutting only in western PEI, or is it all across PEI? Where is these 1.3 million trees, and are we going to get our fair share so that 40,000 more trees can be planted in uh, western PEI? Hello, Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So I don't think anybody's being treated unfairly, but what I will commit to the House today is I'll go back to my staff, I'll find out exactly where all the trees are going. If, if West Prince is not being treated fairly, I'll make sure there's a correction. West, okay, no, West Prince will just, if O'Leary's not being treated fairly, I'll fix it, Madam Speaker. End of question period. Uh, ministerial statements. Uh, Presenting and receiving petitions, 
uh, Honorable Deputy Premier. Uh, Madam Speaker, pursuant to the Rule 78-9 of the Rules of Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island regarding response to petitions tabled under presenting and receiving petitions, I am pleased to submit a response on behalf of the Government of Prince Edward Island for the petition tabled on May 23rd, 2023 by the member of Charlottetown West Royalty, and I move, seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Here. The Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with your indulgence, I'd like to recognize a constituent of mine in the gallery, Jill McDougall. It's nice to have you joining us here today. Uh, we met yesterday, and, and Jill has uh, given me details of, uh, of her experience uh, with our health care here on Prince Edward Island and, and some suggestions on how we might Im improve it. Thank you. Tabling of documents. <clears throat> the Honourable Member from Borden Concora. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, by leave the House, I made a table an article dated the 5th of June by CBC in Nova Scotia regarding the clean fuel regulations on the increases effective July 1st by the federal government and how the increases will be passed on to the consumer by the regulator. And I move, seconded by the member from Rustico Emerald, that the said dog now be received and do lie on the table. Jill yeah. Carey. Yeah. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. Madam Speaker, uh, by leave the House, I beg to leave the table. A letter to patients from Dr. Frost, uh, a draw, sorry, announcing the closure of PEI uh, respirology practice in the Summerside. And in it, it states uh, it's no longer sustainable for me to provide care in PEI with the current system. And I move, seconded by Charlotte and West Royalty, that the said document now received and do lie on the table. Well, Carrie. <laughs> Reports by committees. Introduction of government bills. Government motions. Orders of the day government. The Honourable Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Finance that the first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Here. Order number one, consideration of the estimates and committee. Honourable Deputy Premier. I move seconded by the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to his Majesty. Shall I carry? Honourable Member from Morel Dona and Deputy Speaker, please chair me the whole.
The House is now in committee of the whole House to consider the grant of supply to His Majesty. Minister, do you want to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yes. Shall carry? Welcome back, Chris. Can you introduce yourself and your title for Hansers? Chris Duras, Director of Finance and Administration with the Department of Education and Early Years. Thank you, Chris. Uh, members, we are on page 50, uh, debating the uh, estimates for the Department of Education and Early Years. We are on the Interministerial Women's Secretariat. I have uh, read the section. Are there any more questions on inter Interministerial Women's Secretariat? Question. Cheryl Tam, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wish I could remember where I left off last time, but that's all right. Um, so over the weekend, I was kind of thinking about um, community organizations, and I was thinking about the, um, well, the, the new money in the budget for family violence prevention, which I think is phenomenal. It was a very welcome surprise by, by a lot of organizations. Um, and listening to uh, Daniel O'Malley, who is our fun family violence prevention, um, she had mentioned that she, in doing this work, that it's important to, of course, ensure um, funding for family, family violence prevention, but also for sexual violence. And so PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Center, um, I'm wondering what they came to you with as a proposal and how much of that was granted. I know that you have a good working relationship with them and I'm wondering what that looked like. Yeah, just thanks. Um, remember, this was their proposal. Cheryl and Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I, I had popped in there just to kind of see I'd never been in that space mm -hmm. before and recently and there were buckets on the floor because I actually that was mm -hmm. one of the not-for-profits I was referring to they had five buckets on the floor catching the water that was leaking from the ceiling and apparently it's been like that for years and the landlord will not fix it um, so I say that also in the fact that there I'm wondering if there's if there was any consideration, because one of the things that they would like to do is offer programming. One of the things that government funded them for, which I would like to apply government for, is funding for um, youth, so children who, as young as 12, mm -hmm. to access services there. And the problem is, is that they're not able to even advertise that because they immediately filled up and, and both um, therapists or counselors who are working there in that position, one full-time position, divided in two, and they're they're just, they can't take any more. And so one of the things that they're doing above and beyond that is group work. They have no space to do group work. They have nothing like that. So I'm wondering, um, I guess, given this is the budget that they've got, and, mm -hmm. and they've got, I think, three or four different spaces they're working from, is government considering working with them to find a suitable place that is healthy and big enough to accommodate all staff and all programming Given the vicarious mm -hmm. trauma that that these healthcare professionals are are struggling through, mm -hmm. thanks, uh, Chair, and and thank you. Um, yes, certainly we've had these discussions with the Rape and Sexual Assault Center, and fully recognize that the space they're currently in is not meeting the needs of their clients and their staff. Um, there are ongoing discussions currently with the um, the federal government as well regarding. Um, next steps and um, possible options for funding. So I, uh, I'm i hopeful that those uh, discussions will uh, reap positive benefits for all here. So, yeah. Cheryl Tan, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, and I'm also wondering, I guess, you know, one thing we know about when people come forward asking for money for funding is much like when schools come forward to you to look for staffing numbers. They mm -hmm. do so very, you know, they have their wish list and what they need, and they know that they shouldn't go that high, so they kind of down or lowball it, which I found really an interesting concept, but it's something that I've, you know, being in this position, I've learned more about. And so, given that we know that one in five island children live with sexual abuse, mm -hmm. that those numbers are gonna be really high, and given our commitment 
um, or I should say your government's uh, verbal commitment to early intervention and prevention. Um, will you ensure if this, you know, I know that they are waiting for this, nas this uh, national strategy to, uh, to access funds for, and I think that it's government's responsibility to step in and ensure that early intervention and prevention is being honored. So will you, will you give, work with them and give them more funding once they find out about this stuff so to ensure that our children and youth are given the best shot at a healthy life? Absolutely. As, as I've always done as Minister Responsible for the Status of Women, I've worked with this group as well as all others and and really it's um i'm i feel we have a really strong relationship and generally when they've come forward with uh requests we've been uh, i think very much open to exploring any requests um then the national action plan strategy is going to be w uh anchored um in the work of the coordinated response for sexual violence uh, prevention strategy so uh, this will absolutely be a major component of it and uh, we're we're hopeful that I know um, our director and the ministerial women's secretary she's in negotiations today with the Fed so it's it's exciting um, and there's a lot of work to be done yeah Cheryl time Victoria Prayer. Thank you, Chair, and, and, and I, I do very much appreciate that. Um, I guess my last question on this section, um, actually, I can't, uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'm wondering if the uh, Women's Secretariat have any policy reviews that they're conducting in this budget. I know that, like, for example, the uh, gender-affirming care and PEI was mm -hmm. one that there was a review on and could potentially lead to policy changes within health PEI. Is there any budgeted mm -hmm. in this budget? In terms of policy reviews, it's not necessarily a budget question, but absolutely we have um, staff that are consistently working on policy reviews and gender and diversity analysis, so we can get that back to you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Shall it carry? Carry. Carry. Total interministerial women secretariat three million five hundred twenty one thousand three hundred shall carry. Total Department of Education early years one hundred two million seven hundred seven thousand eight hundred shall carry. Moving on to the commission scholaire du langue français twenty three million two hundred ninety two thousand total expenditure twenty three million two hundred ninety two thousand. Any questions? Question. Cheryl Tan Victoria Park. Um, I know that the Commission Scolaire de Langue Francaise has seen a, um, I guess, just a, a kind of a steady increase over the years. And I'm wondering, this will come back to the budget. I'm wondering if we're expecting this trend to continue. Uh, short answer yes. Honourable members, if you don't mind, I'm just going to read out the entire budget. I just read the summary to start, so and then I'll go back to the list. So, uh, general appropriations provided for the public instructional and support staff salaries and operating grants. Administration, 411900 Salaries, 19980800 000, Maintenance, 1744700 Transportation, 829500 Program material 244,300, equipment and repairs 80,800, total general 23,292,000, and we are on page 52. Charlotte and Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, given that we are expecting that, expecting this population growth within CSLF to continue, I'm wondering if you feel the increase in funding to CS, CSLF is sufficient. Uh, yes, at, at this point, um, through their discussions with the CS left, we feel this is sufficient. Um, but we do do touch points with the board in June after they've uh, attempted their school staffing process, and again in September. And if it's insufficient, um, it'll come up in those discussions. Shelton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if you can. Um, and talk about the, <coughs> the special projects under the superintendent's office. Mm -hmm. 
$17,500. It's one of the handouts here. Yeah, that's a, a budget they keep for special projects. It, it wasn't expended last year. Trail Town Quarry Park. Thank you, Chair. So it's just kind of that th they have that lump sum for any like special projects that might come up. Is that what you mean? That's right. This is the professional services uh, budget, and if there was special ser or uh, sorry professional services required in that area, they'd have a budget for it. But they did not require any last year. Trail Town Quarry Park. Thank you, Chair. And is it so that there's only one um, school psychologist for the entire CSLF board? Yes. Cheryl Time Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I guess my last question, I'm wondering what the new revenue line is under this section. Yeah, that was a, a change in how we account for certain things. So both boards have some of their staff that uh, are seconded out to external organizations when there's some common projects and uh, in the past it's been netted out but we thought it was more appropriate to show the revenue and the expenditure. Good. Shall the section carry? Sure. Carry. Total commission scala du langue francais 23 million 292,000 shall carry. Carried. Public schools branch. General appropriations provided for public instructional and support staff salaries and operating grants. Administration two million two hundred seventy-five thousand six hundred. Salaries two hundred fifty million one hundred eighty-five thousand three hundred. Maintenance fourteen million eight hundred twenty-six thousand. Transportation five million five hundred sixty-one thousand five hundred. Program material three million three hundred thirty thousand nine hundred. Equipment and repairs, one million one hundred eighty-seven thousand four hundred. Total general, two hundred seventy-seven million three hundred and sixty-six thousand seven hundred. Do I have any questions on this? Jerry, Cheryl Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, this is where we were talking. We would find the special resource officer funding, correct? Okay. So. I'm wondering, I'm trying really hard not to go policy. That's excellent. <laughs> Just for you, Chair. Um, so is, so of that $750,000 that has been budgeted, is there funding in there for evaluation of the current program and, and for the rural program moving forward? Uh, the, the current program, there was only Three Oaks Senior High School that had an SRO in the past year. Um, so there's not a really robust program to evaluate yet. Um, but after the coming year, there would be a program evaluation on how it went in our first year of a more robust program. Cheryl Dane, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, and that's really good to hear because, as was mentioned in the motion debate, that is a program that is being questioned around the country. Um, I am going to tell a very quick story. I was out to eat with a friend the other night and this, we were talking <coughs> about this program and there was a large group of young people at the restaurant. So we went over to talk to them and we had a wonderful conversation about special resource officers. There were students from Montague, Surrey and Charlottetown Rural. Charlottetown Rural students said that the program had been stopped because there weren't enough police officers, which they're very smart and said that the police officer was was stationed right next to the mental health, to the school counselor which stops students from accessing mental health services which is really what they need um, at Surrey region at Surrey Regional High the the students reactions were why would we need a, a police officer in our school are we not safe if we had a police officer in our school we would think that we shouldn't feel safe and Montague Senior High, Montague Consolidate, or no, sorry, Montague High said the same thing. So students are not asking for this. Why are we not investing this money where we know it's needed in mental health? Students are not asking for this. The minister has the floor. I know it's not budget, sorry. So is the question, why are we doing it? Where did we get the 
where's it coming from? Uh, Sorry, Cheryl and Victoria Park, you said you had a story to share, and now you have a question on the budget? Yeah. And what is your question on the budget? My question on the budget is, um, hmm? Who's making the decisions for you? For funding that. No, that's not my question. I guess I don't really have a question, more of a, um, that's respectful, more of a, um, respectful, you're going on with too, like, Charlottetown Victoria Park, do you have a question? No, Chair, I don't. Okay. Shall the... No, uh, I do have... I do have a Sorry, I had the leader of the third party on the list here. Thank you. So I'll ask a question sort of related to the story that was just told, and it's the fact that we only have one uh, psychologist for the entire Commission Scolaire. I understand that's... That, that, that's the French language school board, but we know in the English language school board as well, there's tremendous need for psychological services, whether those are delivered uh, through the, the teams that we have in the school or elsewhere. And I'm wondering whether what funding is in this particular section for, is that, is that in another section, the funding for uh, mental health supports for students? We have school psychologists at the board. Is that? Yeah, and that would be in this in this yeah. section. Yeah. Yeah. Could you tell me how Can many? The third school, party? Thank you. Could you tell me how many school psychologists we have for the uh, PSB? We have twelve. Leave to the third party. Thank you. Can you tell me how many schools there are in the PSB? There are fifty-six schools. Right. So, I mean, that's a rough average of one psychologist for every four schools. Um, we know that the, for a number of reasons, and COVID has exacerbated this, um, the mental challenges, uh, anxiety, stress, depression among students. Um, I don't know the exact figures of Prince Edward Island, but I know generally speaking that's a growing issue. Uh, do you feel that the money that we are do you think that the money would be better spent on hiring more school psychologists where we know there is student need than in the resource officers? Um, yeah, certainly, we've heard, and, and I, as minister, I've heard loud and clear that um, there is a need for school resource officers. I mean, we debated in the House here, and the motion passed, and I think the majority were in agreement that this was a reasonable way forward, so I'm pleased that it is in our budget. I think, again, we've tried to find balance in this um, budget. We know that school psychologists are one part of the equation, school resource officers, our school counselors, our uh, mental health team leads, our mental health support workers, there's a, the, you know, our student well-being teams. Um, we, we appreciate and the need for all of these uh, professionals with, that bring different skill sets to the table. Um, and it's not lost on me that, yes, we, there, there needs to be a particular focus on mental health. And I think that's what you'll see in this budget. I think that's what you've seen in the last number of budgets um, that I've that we've tabled for Leader education. Leader Priority? Could you tell me how many student well-being teams we have uh, in the department? Mm -hmm. In the PSB run? Uh, <clears throat> with regards to our budget, uh, we kind of hold the administrative side of the student well-being teams. The actual staff are spread out among justice and health. Right. Okay. Leader Third Priority? Um, Given that we part a part of the cost, the administrative cost sits in this in the PSB. How many student well-being teams do we have? I believe there's one for every family of schools. So that would be nine. Leader of the third party. Sorry, and how many is that? Yeah, I don't have a, a list of them. I think you're close on nine. Okay. Leader of the third party. Are those student well-being teams currently fully staffed? We would have to bring that back. There's mm -hmm. multiple departments involved, so we have to check on that. Lead of the third party. All right. So administration of the student well-being teams lies within the public school branch. Um, 
so presumably the administration involves ensuring that they are fully staffed or adequately staffed. Um, I, I appreciate that coming back. Um, okay. Um, we've heard, oh no, I'm, I'm just a straightforward question on, on the salary line. Um, clearly that's gone up, it, although there wasn't much of an overspend last year, 235 million, but we're now at 250 million. Can you give us a breakdown of how much of that is in, in, in new positions which are created, and I know there's a number of them. Um, how much is in, in just increase in salaries globally as a result of agreements and, and mm -hmm. cost of living, and how much of that is for substitute teachers? So the economic increases and in steps, so yep. that would be the collective agreement settlement was 10.7 10, 10 million, which would include uh, substitutes. And we've added 53 teachers, 41 EA youth service workers, uh, two speech language pathologists, uh, 3.5 school counselors, and that estimated at 5.9 million for a total of 99.5 FTEs. There's a school bus monitor pilot for 50,000, the school resource officer is 750,000 and developing a healthcare career pathway to allow students to more easily transition to health-based careers, 250,000. The third party. Thanks. So you mentioned there that, that, that uh, all of the new positions add up to about 100, 90, 90 something. 99.5 oh, right, in this right. board, and right. then there's another uh, 9.5 in the other board. Okay. So a little over 100. Leader of the third party. So those new 100 positions, those are net new 100 positions. Are they not, are they 100 new positions or minus the attrition that we are, that you, you know, retirements and things like that? No, we don't include retirements when we do those figures. Um, there was a portion of the 100 that were added in the current school year just based on urgent need. But from previous year when we were here to today, there's 99.5 new positions in this section. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Um, a concern, uh, and it's always been a concern, is ratio of students to staff in schools. 100 new staff sounds like an awful lot, but as we know, um, was, uh, showed up in question period today, we have a growing school population, rapidly growing school population. So is 100 new student, uh, 100 new s teachers, is that maintaining the student staff ratio that we have? And I know that's simplistic because we're looking at all positions in the PSP, but are we, are we maintaining the student staff ratio that we currently have with those new numbers? Uh, the new numbers, I think, add to um, a, a very um, large increase that we've had since 2017. So since 2017, we've added 473 staff to the system, which was about a 20% increase in staff. Over that same time period, we saw enrollments increase by about 5%. So we're actually, I think, making really good headway. Um, but there are a lot of needs out there. There's good reasons why we're investing so heavily. Leader of the third party. Thank you. I appreciate those statistics. That, that, is, uh, that certainly sounds like we're doing better than keeping our heads above water, and that's, mm -hmm. that's good to hear. Um, We've also, I mean, moving on from teachers to bus drivers, you know, there, there was in, it was in the news fairly recently that we, or uh, maybe a year, two years ago, that we have a shortage of bus drivers. Where are we with that now? Overall, on the PSB, on the permanent positions, uh, we fill uh, substantially all the positions. Um, there are always challenges on the substitute pool. Um, I think on the bus driver side, it's a stabilized. Um, right now, the pressure on the sub pool is likely in the custodial area, actually. Leader of the third party. Okay. Uh, I think I'm good for this section now. Thank you, Chair. Cheryl down Victoria Park. I'm, I'm good for now, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Carry. Total public schools branch, 277,366,700. Shall it carry? Carry. Thank you, Minister.
Welcome, Minister of Action. Do you need a moment, Minister? No. You're good to go? Well, I need a stranger, yeah. All right, members, we are moving on to the Department of Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. We are on page 58. Minister, would you like to make a motion to bring a stranger to the floor? Yeah, please. Shall it carry? Shall carry. All right. Too late. Very carried. How you doing? Welcome. Could you introduce yourself for answers? Uh, yes, Kelly Balter, Director of Finance for Environment, Energy, and Climate Action. Thank you, Kelly. Minister, do you have any opening comments or anything you wish to table? Um, do I? We have the uh, the table dogs. Minister, can you say yes. I'd like to table? Ta table those, please. Thank you, Minister. I thought they were tabled in the dance. I didn't. I'm not sure how we're doing. Officially, you have to do it at the table. Gotcha. You could, you may have uh, circulated. Do you have a copy of them already? Oh. Yeah, I think you do. <clears throat> All right, corporate services, appropriations provided for the operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister and Centralized Corporate Administrative Services Administration, 17,900. Equipment, 6,500. Material supplies and services, 8,000. Professional services, 10,000. Salaries, 812,300. Travel and training, 58,400. Total corporate services, 913,100. Board and Kinkora. Um, under corporate services, a question I have for you is, in question period a week or so ago, I asked you a corporate question in regarding to a conversation you were possibly going to have with the Federal Minister of Environment as it applies to the National Park and the cleanup. Can you give the House a, an update or how that meeting went or what you've accomplished on that? Confirmation that we're going to get it cleaned up. So it is going to be cleaned up. That's what I was told. Thank you. Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening, of course, environment, energy, and climate action right now. And I'm wondering if you have a strategic plan for the department and what, what those priorities are going to be for the next few years. We have a number. Yeah, we do. Not a strategic plan as such, but. Um, we do have a number of priorities for the next few years. Yeah, we are concentrating on our our free programs at the moment, uh, the net zero programs. I'm sorry, I missed that so one. We're focusing on our net zero programs oh, okay. and the path towards net zero. Leader the third party. Thanks. I see in the corporate services here there's a, a 224,000 jump in salaries. Can you tell us what new staff is being added? Uh, we have additional, so on top of the collective bargaining adjustments, we have yep. two additional staff in this area. Um, we've moved sort of away from the regulatory, not moved away, but in addition to the regulatory nature of the, pro, uh, the department, we also have the program delivery side with net zero programs and the efficiency PI programs. So we've added a couple of resources to support the finance unit. Um, one would be a financial analyst and the other would be a financial clerk. Okay. Yeah. Leader the third party. I'm good for the section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Division Management, appropriations provided for the management and administration of Forest, Fish, and Wildlife Division. Administration, 27,200. Equipment, 3,000. Material supplies and services, 4,700. Professional services, 223,000. Salaries, 307,100. Travel and training, 14,800. Grants, 15,000. Total division management, 594,800. Are there any questions in this section? Chair. Leader of the Opposition. Thanks. Um, on the salaries, <laughs> <laughs> salary line, uh, there was a, a bit of an increase. What was that due to? That's for collective bargaining adjustments. Okay, and that, there was no new hirings, no, no new staff. Not in this section. Thank Leader you of the opposition. No, thank you, Chair. Professional services. Uh, so I'm not sure. I'm looking at the line for uh, your estimate is nil. Um, the forecast was 15,800. Uh, um, and the estimate for this year going in is 223000 Could you just talk about that? Uh, those are funds that will support the implementation of the Emergency Task Force recommendations. 
Leader of the Opposition. Um, could you just elaborate on that a little bit more, sorry? So the 11 recommendations of the Emergency Task Force, Yeah. we have $250,000 in total added to this section mm -hmm. to support that, the implementation. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. And how many of those recommendations have been fulfilled? <laughs> they're, they're all in the process. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much. So how many of them have been completed? Six. Six. Six of the 11. Oh. Leader of the Opposition. Um, that's fast. That's it for now. Yeah. Uh, Leader of the Third Party. Thank you. Cut that off at the pass. So we're looking at forest, fish and wildlife here, and I know that uh, the impacts of Fiona have been pretty profound on the waterways across the province. And I'm wondering whether the there is, and I know there was some talk, I think one of the 11 recommendations from the Forestry Task Force we're talking about was the cleanup of streams in order for the habitat to be suitable for salmon, for example, when they come to spawn. Where are we with the, with the cleanup there? Is that one of the six that's being completed, or is that on the way? No, I think that might take forever. I, mean, I guess so. Yeah. Leader of the third party. So can you tell us uh, what concerns uh, Rosie might have or anybody else in the department regarding the um, sam uh, salmon spawning this spring? I'd have to get back to you. I don't have anything direct that's been given to me. Lead with third priority. So is there more funding coming for, like you say, it's going to take years to do this. So any, any estimate of how much it's going to cost to clean up the rivers and make them suitable? Uh, this would be phase one, so we can bring back that information from the program. Bow to me all the time. Leader of the third party. I'm good for the section. Thank you, Chair. Uh, shall the section carry? Carry. Forest fire protection appropriations provided for the cost associated with forest fire prevention and suppression on private and public lands. Administration 19,400. Equipment 558,000. Material supplies and services 24,900. Professional services 1,500. Salaries 132,000. Travel and training 35,500. Grants 12,000. Total forest fire protection 783,300. Are there any questions? Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, equipment. So that's a considerable increase in that budget line. Can you explain what new equipment is being or planned to be purchased? This is uh, funding, new funding, to provide upgraded fire safety equipment for um, our fire fighting team as well as volunteer fire departments. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. So could you tell us what type of equipment that would be? give you an example. Sure. Um, for example, wild, wildfire gear for volunteer fire departments like Nomex flame resistant coveralls, Pulaski fire axes, other wildlife tools, all, other wildfire tools. Um, yeah. oh. There's training as well, upgraded training. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Chair. How is this allocation of funds uh, um, um, decided? The request came from the program when we were preparing um, for this year's budget, and that was the amount of funding they had requested for fiscal 23-24. That was in budget. <laughs> um, the opposition. Thank you, Chair. When you say they, who do you mean by that? The programs, program manager and director. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. In consultation with departments across the island? Or? I, I would have to bring that information back. If you would, please, yeah. that would be great. So, sorry, Chair. Lead of the opposition. So is this enough fund for them, for what is the requests that were put in? Expensive taxes. Hi. It's first steps, um, mm -hmm. based on what I'm seeing in terms of what the potential here is for uh, the activity that might be carried out, um, we probably would need to supplement this amount. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, so is this a, a permanent, going to be a permanent line item, or is this temporary? It, it, it hasn't been determined yet. At the time, it was requested to be a one-time temporary um, adjustment. Uh, there is a possibility there's a possibility we would leave the amount in the budget to use for other items as well. Sure. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. So is there any um, larger equipment purchases for, let's say, uh, uh, forest firefighting? We do have a capital budget for forest firefighting. Mm -hmm. So this year we are replacing a muskeg, which is an off-road yep. um, vehicle. That's in our current year capital budget. Okay. Yep. Uh, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much for that. So, um, so in professional services, I'm seeing an increase of 5,700. Could you explain that? Can you just, uh, and even look at the line. So it was 1,500 um, 
that you estimated last year, but your forecast was 14,900. Mm -hmm. Yep. We have increased call center services related to the uh, Hurricane Fiona. Leader that. So the response and recovery, sorry. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. I have a question regarding uh, the request for interest of any civil servants who wanted to partake in forest fire fighting. Would that be in this division? Yes, it would be. Okay. The training would we'll be the opposition. Thank you, Chair. So what I would find that under travel and training? It, the entire additional amount is allocated under the equipment budget, but we would utilize it wherever we needed to utilize it. So we may transfer it during the year into, tra or to, into training, yes. Leader of the Opposition. Sure. So I, I guess I just need more explanation on that. So in equipment, part of that would be train. What's going to come out of that is the training for that program. Is that correct? Correct. Huh? Yeah. Could you tell us what that amount is? It's or will you, you put budgeted for the, the training of civil servants specifically? We haven't broken it down. We've just allocated the additional 550 into the budget for the current year, and we'll you use it where it it is needed. Leader of the opposition. Um, thank you, Chair. I just have an, a little difficulty understanding the equipment purchases and then now the training being thrown into that and then just a number, how you came up with the number of $558,000. It's an operating budget, so it's not all for equipment. It's for a variety of things, I think, is what you're being told. Leading the opposition. So can I request a complete breakdown of what we'll that was budgeted for, please? Thank you. And that's, that's fine. Yeah. Shall the section here? Leader of the third party. Thanks. So I'm wondering why there's no increase in salaries here from last year, given the situation that we find ourselves in. There are no staff members assigned to this section. This is for standby callback of the firefighting team. Um, the firefighting team is made up of staff members that work in our, in other sections. So their well, salaries are paid from those other sections. Oh, it could be a director. It could be, like, we have firefighting staff that have regular jobs in our department. Leader of the third party. Thanks. And just for my own uh, interest, the, like when we pull in firefighters here, for example, to, if we were to have a fire that we required out of province help, and I know we have reciprocal agreements with other provinces, but who pays for the firefighters who have to come here if, if we ever ended up in that situation? Question. When we send firefighters away, they, we get reimbursed for those costs, so we haven't had that circumstance happen here, but I would expect the same would, would apply. Um, were we to have firefighters come to this province. All the time. Right. Leave the third party. Right, so just so I'm clear, so if, and again, let's hope it never happens, but, or let, let's use a real life example, the, the PEI firefighters that are in Nova Scotia right now, the, their salaries are currently being covered by the provincial government there, the Nova Scotia government? We would be reimbursed for their overtime and call back and those sorts of things. We would continue to pay their regular salary out of the province. From our from PEI. Okay. Leader of the third party. Right. Thank you for that clarity, Kelly. Um, the I'm going, to, I'm going to go back to the uh, the um, eleven. Uh, oh my gosh, the this the oh, I'm sorry, forestry, the emergency forestry task force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eleven uh, recommendations, and one of them was to identify high, medium, and low risk fire areas. And I know that. Um, you're doing mapping of that using satellite imagery. How, how far along are we with that? I think halfway. We have all the satellite imagery, and I think that obviously staff has a... We don't have dedicated staff to do it because that's not... This type of thing wasn't a normal activity, right. so um, they're getting called away, obviously, to do other things as time goes. So I think we're about halfway through through that. But, I mean, we've been, I think they've identified some things that we're working on, and that's why we're doing cleanup in some areas already, because we we know it's crucial in those areas. Leader of the third party. So if you, once you've identified a high-risk area, is that, does that then become a priority for the department to go ahead and clean up? Is that how yeah. you, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there's challenges with that, though. It's, we can clean up crowd land, but we don't own all the land, so that's when we have programs to work with landowners, and we didn't, never really talked about in here is, the NAFTA agreement and how we have to be ever so cautious not to break that by um, giving 
money to somebody to harvest softwood that could then end up in the market. Yeah, we've been warned to watch out for breaking after by help. And so it's a, we want, really want it cleaned up, but we don't want to get a strike of a NAFTA, wow. obviously. Yeah, so it's created a really weird challenge. Yeah. That's really interesting that PEI, little PEI, could distort the global marketplace when right. it comes to soft food supply. Anyway, um, I have to say, Minister, that because um, my wife and I have been dragging brush down to the road for the last month, and it was picked up yesterday, fantastic service. Um, uh, one guy with a truck and a boom on it, and he, he was there for well, he was there for a while because we had a big pile, several big piles, and we got more to come back. Um, so that program goes till the end of June, and that's a re would that be found in this transportation? Transportation. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll forget that question. I'm I'm good. Anyway, thank you for thank you transportation on for the for that program. It's great. Shall I carry? Production development, appropriation provided for the production of trees and shrubs for forest management on private and public forest lands, carbon capture, watershed enhancement, and local landscape nurseries, as well as the tree improvement seed production program. Administration, 45,400. Equipment, 12,000. Material supplies and services, 494,500. Professional services, 15,500. Salaries, 1,075,600. Travel and training, 18,500. Grants, $600. Total production development, 1,662,100. Are there any questions in this section? Shall I carry, or lead of the opposition? Um, on, um, so I don't see any increase here. So I know in the questions earlier, the uh, member from Larry and Vernas was talking about uh, the amount of trees and, and planet and, and, and the shortage of trees for, in particular, the West Prince area. And it was talked that the nurseries would have to catch up with the demand of the forest uh, that was destroyed with uh, Fiona, and I'm sure um, Dorian was also included in that. Is under this section, is that where the nurseries are funded? Capital. Well, they're fun they'd be funded there, but the okay. capital. But it's only happen. operational. Yeah. Okay. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. So, is there any increase in salaries required to try to get those numbers back up? We do have a new nurse, nurse reform in position budgeted mm -hmm. here in fiscal 23-24. The, the, sorry, Kelly, go ahead. And that's to support the increased production. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. Are there any other, uh, are there any vacancies within in this uh, particular um, division in, in the nurseries, let's say, other than your new hire? Um, we have one vacant position is the tree, uh, tree improvement reform in position. Leader of the Opposition. Uh, also, can you just give us, just roughly, I don't know the exact percentage of what trees generally are, are grown in the nursery? I'm sure they're all native to PEI, they're but which ones specifically? Are they white spruce and pine? I think it's a mix. I'd have to get that back, but I know that one yesterday were maple that we gave the students. So. This is what we're growing under. Six native species, white spruce, white pine, eastern hemlock, white birch, yellow birch, and red maple. Thank you, Chair. Do you have a breakdown of what those are? So, like, let's say for hedgerows and such, right, they're going to use more of the, the, the pine and the spruce, right? And I'm assuming that most of your requests for anyone with hedgerows or, or forestry harvest would, would probably go with softwood. Could you just... Maybe bring back that information. Yeah, we'll break. We'll, we'll bring back that breakdown, and we'll break down where they're going to answer your colleague's question from earlier. By road. By road. <laughs> Broken down by road. Shall the section carry? Uh, leader of the third party. Let's just follow up on that a little bit. This is the Frank Goody Nursery we're talking about here, right? And um, I know there's been a push from some foresters on the island here to move away from the dependence. I can tell you that white, white spruce is by far the predominant, I, I don't want to say what percentage, but I would say upwards of 80% of the sapling seedlings are, are going to be white spruces that figure we're going to get back. Um, but there's been a push to diversify our forests and sort of recreate the old Acadian hard, well, we call them Acadian hardwood forests, but there's softwoods in there as well. But um, 
Do you know if that is a strategic plan coming from the nursery, and if so, whether there's going to be any extra cost involved in that? Bringing it back to the budget? I think we'd have to bring that back. Yeah, we'd have to bring that back from the, um, from the section. Leader of the third party. Thank you. And I see that there's a $122,000 uh, jump in salaries here. Can you just explain what, what that is? Uh, yes, that's one new position, a nursery foreman position, as well as collective bargaining adjustments. Okay. Lead of the third party. I am good for this section. Chair Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll leave the opposition. So, in the, so if uh, landowners wanted to apply for tree planting for hedgerows or, or forest harvesting, what have you, what is the current charge per plant, for, for planting? One dollar. One dollar. Is there any um, discussion on that increasing? Would you like an increase? Mm -hmm. Leader of the third party. Absolutely not. But it used, okay, to, be, okay. it used to be a quarter. Oh, did it? Yeah, it was a quarter. And then Back it went up to a dollar pretty quick. No, not too long ago. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I was just wondering if it went up that much, if there was going to be an increase in the near future again. So. It's been one dollar since 2019 2020. Um, I'd have to check before that what the price was and where yeah. it went to a dollar. Okay, please, thank you. you that's, that's fine, thanks. Shall the section yeah. carry? Carry. Field services, appropriation provided for the sustainable management of public land and financial and technical assistance to private woodlot owners. Administration 32,700, equipment 13,600, material supplies and services 528,300, professional services 200, salaries 2,581,000. Travel and training 205,800, grants 1,522,000, total field services 4,883,600. Are there any questions? Uh, leader of the third party. Uh, so I see that the material supplies and services line here is more than doubling it. What, can you explain what that is? Yes, we have um, under material supplies and services $300,000 additional amount for the um, post Fiona woodlock cleanup. On public land. Post Fiona, what? Sorry. Woodlock it? cleanup. Oh, public Woodlock. Land. Okay. Yeah. Leader of the third party. Right. Uh, the forestry enhancement program. That's a great program, and I, I, I'm wondering whether you've seen any change, increase, whatever, in the use of that program, or more people applying, for example. I'd have to. I only have the 22-23 figures, so I would have to go back and compare right, from compare. year to year. Yeah, sure. I can bring that back. Okay, I appreciate sure, Bertie. Thanks, Kelly. Um, the low carbon fund, it's about a quarter of a million. Can you tell us what that is for? So that was a federal, provincial low carbon economy fund um, program that operated from 2018-2019 until 22-23. Um, and this, those funds were for reforestation efforts. Leave the third party. Okay. Um, can you give us a breakdown? I know that what the percentage of public versus private land is across the province, but can you tell us in terms of management uh, under this section what what the breakdown is of public and private land that's been managed here? Eighty-seven percent is private land, with the remaining thirteen percent belonging to the crown. Right. The third party. And that's under management. That's not just as it exists per acre, uh, uh, acreage across the province. That's what's being managed under this plan, is it? I don't think so. Oh no, no. So sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah. Oh, I no, probably I didn't word the question yeah. very clearly. Um, I, I guess how much is being covered for each private and public land under the forest enhancement plan? We'd have to come back to mm -hmm. that. I think. Yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. Thanks. Do you have a target or in in mind for the amount of land you'd like to have under the forest management plan ultimately? Well, we know what we're trying to get to total. I mean, I think we're at five point two percent protected. That's shared between obviously other partners. And we met when we met last not last week, the week before in Ottawa the the push was to get everybody to 30 by 30, which we know is impossible for, for us. Yeah. But yeah. The, the conversation I had with the minister after the meeting was over was that we 
we were obviously trying to be really aggressive, and that's why we have a partnership with the Nature Conservancy and the Island Nature Trust, and we want to expand on that. And they could probably do even more if we had more money. And so I talked about what was the availability of federal funds, and it sounded really promising. So I think the ball kind of in my court to throw a number out there, which I'm preparing to do. So um, as it as it applies to what what, what we protect, we, we obviously need to do way more than what we currently have. Leave it there. <coughs> So, Minister, are you prepared to throw a number out now what the goal is? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I, I, the goal I said to him was 10%, yep. which is a lot of land. Right. Well, but it's a lot double of Double what we have, basically. It's, yeah, double what we have. But it's a lot of dollars. But I, we have really good partners that are doing really good work for us through the Nature Conservancy on Nature Trust. They, they're doing all of the work, basically. Yeah. So all we're really providing is, is funds. And we do the NAP protection so that... It doesn't hurt against their land limits and those types of things. Do you have any idea what the cost of that, if we were to double? I mean, that would be beautiful. I'd, I'd be cheering you on for that. How much would that cost? Oh, would it be tens of millions, I yeah. think, right now to do it? Yeah. Do you have a third party? One of the benefits of having uh, more land protected uh, is in terms of protection of species here and endangered species. I'm thinking bats, particularly in, in this yeah. situation. Do we, uh, oh, this is a policy question. Maybe I'll get away with it if the chair's not listening. Uh, how are oh, we? Oh, I'm we're, listening. We're, listening we're, your language, too. <laughs> uh, where are we with the... Um, we're not in Scotland anymore. <laughs> where are we with the species at risk legislation? Will that be coming back? Yeah, well, <laughs> we kind of committed to work with your caucus, so if you want to come in and meet about it, then, yeah, yeah it's okay. on the table, yeah. It's, uh, it's in our draft plan. It's it, it's in our draft legislation plan, but um, don't table much legislation myself. Okay, I'm good for this section. I appreciate that, Chair. Uh, shall the section carry? Sure. Resource inventory and modeling appropriations provided for the collection, analysis, and interpretation of land use inventory information and trends. Administration six thousand five hundred. Equipment ten thousand, material supplies and services ten thousand nine hundred, professional services seven thousand five hundred, salary six hundred forty two thousand eight hundred, travel and training sixteen thousand five hundred, grants five hundred, total resource inventory and modeling six hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred. Shall it carry? Oh, I have a question for the leader of the third party. So back in 2020, 22, it was reported that the state of the forest report would be released this month, June 2023. Obviously, things have changed. I get that. Um, but when can we expect that State of the Forest report to be released? Do you know? Are you to me? No, I, don't know. I can get you the, the yeah. answer, but I mean, we've obviously, it literally blew away on us last fall. Um, I will get you an answer. Yeah. Leader of the third party. And I, I appreciate, obviously, that overnight, you know, the state of our forest changed. More than they have, you know, ever in in, in that length of time. Uh, but I think Islanders would appreciate. I mean, I know it took, you know, it was 2013, I believe, for the, before the 2010 report came out. So we're now into the third year past when it was due. But I think Islanders, even with the gaps that might be there, would appreciate an, at least an interim report on where we are. Because I know when we had an exchange here in question period, it was in the last session. That people were quite surprised at the how much forested land we'd lo we've lost over the last few years. Um, is there any chance that you could release some information in an interim report this year? Yeah, we'll release it. I mean, it's very fair. I complain about the federal inventory for our, our carbon numbers all the time, that it's, it's, no, it's so old, it's no good to us to make decisions with. Yep. And I think that I would say this is in that same category with Obviously, the hurricane happened, which didn't help. But we need to have more timely information so that so that the people who own the woodlots, which is mostly islanders, right, because they own ninety percent of the land, are able to make good decisions, or we're able to make better policy to govern how forests work. So yeah, I'll, I'll I'll bring something back. I'll try to bring something back before the session ends to table and okay. whatever we have, like for what it's worth now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Leave the third party. No, I, I think I think a lot of people would be very anxious to see that. Um, I'm wondering whether the delay. I mean, I know it's traditional 
for the forest report to be late. But um, is, are there things that, like, is this a staffing issue? Is it like, what, what's causing these reports to be as late as they are? That's a, it's a good question. I mean, we do run on a pretty small staff. I'm trying to grow it and we're trying to grow our budget. We've had two big jumps in the past year as far as budgets go for, which I think I'm proud of my involvement in, you know, making an envi the environment file more important on the government eyes. So um, I'll get you the exact answer, but I, you know, there's probably a number of factors, competing interests in, internally that are not political ones, but people that are being pulled away to do other things sure. that keep it from happening. And, um, you know, hours go by like minutes sometimes, and all of a sudden you're late with, with something. And once you're late, you're late, and I guess it's easier to push it off. But I'll get you a better answer on that, and I'll get you the, all the information that we have. We'll leave the third party. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Minister. I appreciate that. So, apart from the the once a decade state of the forest report, what sort of what other analysis comes out of this department, this section? What do you mean that? They are responsible for the GIS mapping. Okay. Um, in this section. We'll leave the third party. Is that all, Kelly? Um, so this involves the acquisition of aerial photography, the production of land use and land cover mapping products, and the establishment and measurement of forest management plots. Other activities include monitoring forest growth and conducting special forestry projects. Okay. Leave Chair Bird. Thanks. Um, so land use is mentioned in this section. I'm wondering how much of the funding uh, goes to land use work and what that would be. These would be the staff that would support that work. Um, there's no dedicated land use fund in this section. Leave the third party. So just say that again, Kelly, what the land use work this, is. That's it, well, they, this, this staff supports land use work, so the utilization of the land and the mapping of the land, but there's no dedicated land use um, funding in this, here. in this section. I get it. Thank you. Chair. Leave the third party. Uh, the net zero plan uh, identified that land use planning is going to be a really critical part of making our province sustainable. So I'm wondering, does this section contribute to the work that's happening in uh, the Department of Housing, Land and uh, Communities? I'm not sure that it does. I'm, I'm talking about in creating a land use policy. I'm sure it probably supports that objective. Um, Specifically, I would have to bring that information back. What their, what their um, activities are. Yep. Leave it yes. Heard. Yeah. Uh, just to clarify, Kelly, just because the land use planning has implications in all kinds of areas, but our um, efficient use of resources and providing services is is one, and maintaining agricultural land, which obviously has a big impact on net zero. Um, so. Yeah, just exactly how the, this department interacts with housing, land, and communities in the net zero, um, and sorry, not net zero, and provincial land use policy. I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Chair sure. Tove. Sure. I'll leave the opposition. Just one question on the land use funding. Where would we find that? The land would be housing, land, and communities. Okay, so not even in this. No. Okay, thanks. Shall total resource inventory and model and carry? Fish and Wildlife appropriations provided for the administration and management of various programs designed to conserve, protect, and enhance the province's fish and wildlife resources, as well as financial support to community-based organizations through Watershed Management Fund. Administration, 25500 Equipment, 17500 Material Supplies and Services, 114000 Professional Services, 7500 Salaries, 1378700 Travel and Training, 59000 Grants, 4545500 Total Fish and Wildlife, 6147700 Leader of the Opposition. Six thousand. What was the reason for this overspending? 
We had fiscal year 21-22 commissions paid to um, angling and hunting licensed vendors paid from fiscal 22-23. Um, opposition. Thank you very much. So equipment at uh, saw over spending of 7900 So what exactly was uh, the reason for that? What was the purchase? We had additional office equipment and furniture purchase, um, additional field and shop equipment. Um, I would. That's a small amount, but I would have to bring back specifically what was purchased. Okay. Leave to the opposition. Thank you, Chair. Material supplies and services. Uh, they saw an overspending of... Uh, 17,700. Can you just explain what that reason was? The biggest component of that was for firearm safety hunter education courses. Mm -hmm. And we had some equipment repairs. Okay. Um, Leader of the opposition. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so will that be, again, this year, that overspending for those courses, um, will that happen again in the next, in the 2023-24 budget year? I wouldn't be able to speculate. It's a possibility. Okay. Uh, leader of the opposition. Um, so salaries increased by over 150,000. So, was there a new position or positions created? No new positions. We have collective bargaining adjustments in this section. Leader yeah. of the opposition. I guess with the salaries of one point, almost 1.4 million, I guess 150,000 dollars would take care of that. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, so, travel and training, uh, there's an overspending there of 40000 Can you explain that? We had higher than anticipated costs for in-province mileage, um, vehicle operating costs, and in-service training. Leader of the Opposition. So, was that all something that, uh, I guess, can you give me a breakdown on that? Not specifically in terms of numbers. Um, we had an additional 10900 in in province travel costs, um, 11000 in uh, vehicle operating costs, and in service training, an additional 12300 Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much. So, what was that travel uh, cost accredited to? I can, it was probably standby callback associated with the avian influenza standby um, last. Last year, leader of the opposition um, in, in grants. So there was an overspending of uh, thirty-one thousand and five hundred. Yet, so but yet grants this year are still back to um, well, I guess below uh, what they were for budget. Is there? Can you explain the reason for that? Yes, there's an adjustment to one of the FedProv agreements um, in fiscal twenty-three twenty-four. So that's a net change um, related to that federal provincial agreement. One more leader of the opposition. I can put you back on the list. Uh, sure, put me back on the list. Do you want to ask one more? No, nope, put me okay. back on the list. Yeah. Uh, Sheldon Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know that um, the leader of the third party had asked about uh, species at risk. Would the funding for that be in this, in this one, or what would it be under the for the former one? There's no dedicated funding here for species at risk, but that area responsibility would fall under this section. Okay. Cheryl Town, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. So in the event that that this legislation were to move forward, there would be some money in this budget for that? Yes, we do have funding that supports um, other organizations to uh, protect species at risk. So that's in our grant funding. We have several pieces of funding for um, NGOs. Charlton Victoria Burr. Thank you, Chair. And I'm wondering how many staff um, within this budget have expertise in managing species at risk. Is that something that you would know? Let's see. I would have to bring that back if there's one specific or whether then you know there's shared responsibility over several positions, but I can bring that back. Cheryl, can I have a that would be great. Thank you. Um, so, is there anything budgeted here for establishing an advisory committee for species at risk to bring uh, expertise from outside the department as well as engage the broader community? Not in this budget. Cheryl, can I have a Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, so you had mentioned the various groups that you fund. To, to do the, the species at, at risk work. And I'm wondering how you coordinate all the work that you are funding 
um, to make sure the different projects achieve the desired outcomes. Is that something that you do? The, the unit does that. Um, they, we, we have funding agreements with the groups that have certain deliverables, and there's reporting following the conclusion of the funding agreement to ensure the deliverables are met. Shout out Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. And so that's something that you kind of leave up to the individual organizations to? Yes, and our program staff as well. They liaise well with the, um, with the funded groups. Shout out Victoria Burke. Thank you, Chair. Um, and uh, so given that the approximately 90% of the land in PEI is privately owned, um, there's going to be some measures that need to be taken to protect species on, on private property. Can you explain how the department involves the public in measures to protect wildlife? Honorable member, can you somehow tie that to a yes. budget? Yes, Question? I can do that. Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering um, if there's money allocated in this budget to support private landowners in protecting uh, wildlife on their private property. Or to support that. Budget. There's nothing in this budget. Can you repeat that? Sorry, there's nothing in this budget for private landowners. Charlotte and Victoria Park, one Thank more, and then share. I can put you back on the list. Yeah, that would be great. I'm wondering, um, is there any budget in here, is there any money in budget in here for, for buying land to protect or compensate um, for, like, if there's if there's species at risk that need to be protected on the land, is there any any money budgeted in here for, for anything like that that might come up if we were to find a new species or perhaps we have seen where a species at risk is living where we would be able to... Uh, compensate perhaps private landowners to not cut down an area or something like that? Not in this section, but later on you'll see in environmental land management there is some funds for species at risk um, to, um, it's delayed hay cutting to prevent a certain species, so, yep. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr. So this is on grants. Um, so for operating grants to uh, different uh, watershed uh, management groups across the island, was there much, there is no increase into it, but was there any asks from their representatives for an increase in funding, operating funding? We do have an additional $250,000 in this budget um, for watershed management groups. Okay. The opposition. Thank you very much. I guess I didn't do my math very well here, did I? I think you're just seeing that what you're seeing there is a net change from budget to budget. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a combination of factors that okay. make it a reduction versus an increase. Okay. So uh, I'm sorry, Leader Chair. Opposition. Could you just repeat that again? What was the increase? So the total change was, was of course, a reduction from last year's budget to this year's budget for grants, but yep. it's a combination of factors. So we have an additional $250,000 for watershed management groups. Okay. We have an additional 150 to, you know, support expanded watershed network. Okay. Um, an additional $125,000 to support the Edward Fish Hatchery. Okay. And then, of course, we have the adjustment for the federal provincial um, program for fiscal 24. So that's what has resulted in a, in a negative amount from budget to budget. Leave that position. Okay. Well, can you just give us the reason why the increase for the hatchery? It's additional operating funding to yeah. support the hatchery for recreational fisheries. Okay, but yeah. can you explain what the reason was for the increase? They have requested additional funding and we're happy to support that. Okay, so the increase for watersheds uh, for operating grants was $250,000. Was that evenly distributed among all of the um, watershed groups or was it just specific uh, groups that received some extra funding? From my understanding, the it, it hasn't been distributed yet, so I believe each one of the watershed groups to date um, so far this year has received a, a status quo amount of funding from last year, and then the program will apply the funding formula that's been developed to determine what adjustment there is needed based on the additional amount. Okay, thank you. Uh, Cheryl and Victoria Burke. Okay, shall the section carry? Total forest, fish, and wildlife, 14766200 Shall carry? Climate Action Secretariat, 
Climate action. Appropriations provided to administer the new climate adaptation plan support the Interdepartmental Climate Action Secretariat, administer the Climate <coughs> Challenge Fund, and administer the climate change related federal provincial funding agreements. Administration 19,500, equipment 55,000, material supplies and services 118,500, professional services 325,000, salaries 805,700, travel and training 33,500, grants 1,999,800, total climate action 3,357,000. Are there any questions in this section? Uh, leader of the third party. So I'm wondering if you can explain the difference between this secretariat, the Climate Action Secretariat, and the Office of Net Zero, and you know which comes in a later section. What, how are they different, and and, and what programs fall under which sections? It's a great question. This <laughs> <laughs> perhaps one you've asked yourself. I have. I have asked the same question. I'll, Kelly can answer the the. Uh, technical part but what I'll say is that this has been a discussion is that we're doing it we're, we're doing similar streams of, of things and there's times when we need we're work we working together because we have to um, because like the inventory numbers would, would sit on one side and the, the the team that's trying to reduce those is on another side so um, there's been a lot of talk about how do we bring that under a, sing, a single roof to better um, streamline the process so that we're getting the best results we can get. So yep. Kelly can actually answer the actual question. Mm -hmm. um, as far as programs go, um, we have, let me just see here, we have funding agreements with UPEI, so on coastal erosion and flood mapping, so yep. those are in, the, in there. We have um, a climate challenge fund is administered through this section, so that's for projects to support um, initiatives to um, reduce what <laughs> to support our targets, um, as well as there's funding here for a regional hub, Atlantic Hub, for climate expertise. Leave the third party. Supports for the agricultural sector in getting to net zero or in climate action. Would that would we find that in this section or is that somewhere else? Those are in the efficiency PEI section. Okay, great. Forward to that. Leave the third party. Thanks. So the Atlantic provinces that we're trying to reach uh, agreement with the federal government on uh, carbon pricing but of course the plans were rejected we know that so I'm wondering if that has had any impact on the budget in this department this year um, but we would see that over in the net zero section um, so we'll get to that section later okay let me just make a note Do you have any more questions, Leader of the Third Party? Uh, yeah, I do actually, Chair. Thanks. Go ahead. Um, how does the Climate Action Secretariat coordinate all of the climate change related activities that go on across government? I mean, it seems like an extraordinarily difficult thing to manage. How, how does that work? They, I think there's a sort of intergovernmental committee um, of climate change coordinators across. Um, across government and all departments um, so we have in our in this budget for this year we have a climate change court new climate change coordinator position to sell to help other departments with their activities as well as to um, support the climate adaptation plan okay. the third party. right so, so that's a new position in this department and they would liaise with a similar position in each department across government it'll be called something different presumably in each that's department correct. Yeah. It may or may not be a new position in that department. They might have um, have already had that that position. This would be our interdepartmental coordinator to support and liaise with all those other departments. Yep. Okay. Leader of the third party. That's interesting. So, for example, the, the big push to electrify the bus system in the education system, there would be that's a situation where you're climate change, well, maybe that's in the net zero, yes, <laughs> net zero, of course it is. Uh, but that's where this would, even though the, the position resides in climate action secretariat, the, the initiative comes from net zero and it would be coordinated with the Department of Education and early years, is that how that would work? Yeah. Probably. Or transportation, maybe, in that case. Yeah, that's how it would work. I mean, we have a, 
a subcommittee for transportation that has members from both departments on it. And same with our active transportation committee. It has uh, people from many departments sit on, sit on that one to make those decisions. But I, the question is whether or not that's the model that's going to be the most effective for yeah. us going, going forward. And um, like Kelly's a good example of somebody who's embedded in our department but, but doesn't work for our department, works for fi finance. And we have our public service commission folks that HR people that sit on our floor, they're embedded in our department, but they answer to another department. And I've often asked, do, is the mo would the model be better served if we had a similar model where they worked for us, but were embedded in the department so that they, their daily task was to, you know, the, the steps yeah. that we were trying to take. Because yeah. sometimes you get, you get pulled in lots of directions if, you know, if your department wants you to do other work instead of this, then it may not necessarily be the priority. So we, we're, there's a lot of talk about would the model be better if we could ensure it was an absolute priority every single day? I think I know the answer. <laughs> we'll leave the third priority. So I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do here with climate change is reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I'm wondering where those, ultimately where the calculations on how much we're reducing our global, our Got our greenhouse gas emissions lies like who, who's who's the bean counter and where does that sit? It all really resides federally. Like this is an issue that I have. We would send some information to them, but a lot of the inventory numbers we don't have, we don't collect. The federal government collects directly. Like things like fuel sales is reported directly, and or or fertilizer, we don't have access to them. But we've been having this conversation very, very recently about how do we get more accurate inventory numbers that we can have. Like, like I've already said, two-year-old numbers aren't any good to us because it's great to say two years ago we moved the needle, but are we moving it today or did we move it this quarter? Like I'd like to be able to say on a quarterly basis, once we have it the year over year, when we report in April, we can show what every April has looked like and it gives us a better gauge on whether or not we're moving the marker. It's very hard to try to determine that the, the steps we've taken have been good enough or quick enough or hard enough when we have to wait for two years to get a report back. So we're looking at how we can get modeling internally constantly. Right. Leave it to the third party. If I can use an example here, the, there was a story just yesterday, I believe, uh, on the pelletized, slow-release nitrogen fertilizers. And we know nitrous oxide is a m massively dangerous uh, greenhouse gas, far more potent than carbon dioxide or even methane. And in a situation like that, where we don't have provincial figures on the amount of fertilizer we use, but we're in a position where we can incentivize farmers, because there's a higher upfront cost in doing that, and while there may be significant savings collectively for society in terms of lower greenhouse gas emissions, farmers don't get the benefit of that unless they're paid for their environmental services. And that is something that could come from a provincial government. So how do you coordinate that where you've got a federal government that has the data that you need and you're trying to come up with a program to incentivize for incentivize farmers at a provincial level? How, how do you cost that? Like, how do you... It just, it's a mind-bogglingly complicated thing. Right, it is. It's, that's the issue we're tackling right now, is how do, we, how do we do that so we can be more accurate and have the programs that we need? Because we have aggressive targets, so we have to move it quickly all the time. So yeah, that's a project that we're working on. I wish I could talk more about it, but it's in its infancy. But the, to do exactly what you're saying is to have that kind of information all the time. And every time I go to a, a FedProp meeting, I say the same thing to the minister, we need these. But the, we need the inventory numbers more often. And I think the other provinces now that they're starting to move in the direction we're, we're moving in are saying the same thing, that the inventory numbers that are two years old aren't enough to make the decisions. And we're a small province, and we'll be challenged to meet our goals, but some of those big problems are going to be challenged yeah. to meet the federal goal. Just sticking with the agricultural sector for a minute, the goal federally is 30 degree at 30 percent reduction in fertilizer use by 2030. 
Uh, and that's pretty aggressive. Uh, I know a lot of farmers are concerned about that, recognizing the costs that that's going to present to them. And that's where government has to step in and incentivize that and make sure that the public service they're providing is compensated. Um, where would the funding provincially come? Like, would that be in this section here, or would that be somewhere else where we will be paying farmers to capture carbon? That would be in our net zero office. Okay. We'll use the third grade. And we're, we're talking considerable dollars here. So um, is that, obviously, you're negotiating with the federal government there on, on how, how you're going to achieve that. How far, like, do we have significant funds, enough funds in the in our different section. Uh, maybe I'll save that question to net zero as well, but that, that's a really important thing. I'll, I'll stop for now, but I, if I can get back on the list, if, if there's nobody else, I'll keep going. Good discussion. Uh, Cheryl Tan, Victoria Park. Okay. Um, under the grant section, there's $178,000 to UPEI for flood hazard identification and mapping. I'm wondering um, if you can just talk a bit about what that funding will do. So, sorry, I don't remember. What, uh, what section is that under again? Um, Climate Action Secretariat, I think. No, I know. Just which, which line item were you referring to? Oh, grants. Thank you. Um, yes, so the work that UPEI will, will perform for us, they do pluvial flood mapping and community outreach elements. So those funds are part of a federal provincial um, funding agreement with, I think it's Natural Resources Canada and UPI supports um, the delivery of that agreement. Sheldon, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And I have to say how much I love seeing these line items because I think that accessing the expertise of students is, is a really amazing way to solve kind of bigger wicked problems that that we're facing right now and how long of a project is that I believe that particular project expires 2324 um, it is part of the Fed, federal provincial program which is expired in March 31st of 2024 um, and I, at this point I wouldn't know if it would be extended um, this possibility um, so far I haven't heard anything about that though Thank you, Chair. I don't know how you know all this stuff off the top of your head. It's very impressive. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering, <laughs> is, does this, is there funding in this budget to incorporate the findings so that we can, if there's any projects that come as a result or if there's anything that we need to incorporate into our policies or what we're, or what we're doing, is there money in this budget for that? So the outcomes? With, um, at this point in time, there's not. So I would expect that perhaps if there was additional funding required, it would be a 24-25 um, budget request. Yeah. Shout out Victoria Burke. That would make sense given we don't know what the findings are at the moment. Um, so there was a report a few years back that told us that Charlottetown was one of the least prepared uh, municipalities in Canada when it comes to flood risk and I'm wondering if what we would find in this budget in terms of what we're providing to this to this municipality um, to adapt for this climate risk um, there is no specific funding for the city of Charlottetown in this budget Charlottetown Victoria Burke thank you chair and I guess my last question on this section, um, there's a $443,000 grant to various parties for natural disaster emergency resiliency. I'm wondering if you could explain what this work is funding. That was the purchase of generators post Fiona that were assigned to fire departments. Leave the opposition. Sorry about that, Chair. Um, I noticed in um, material supplies and services. So last year there was a 100, or this year, sorry, in the budget is a hundred thousand dollar increase, and last year there was an underspend. Can you explain that? Uh, last year it was just fewer material supplies and services required. Um, for the coming year, there's an additional $100,000 for public outreach and um, education for the Climate Adaptation Plan. Leader of the Opposition. Very much so. We'll move on to professional services. There, 
It was uh, an underspend by a considerable amount. Um, and then now this year's budget's going up, but still lower than what last year's budget um, estimate was. Can you explain that? So the variance between 22-23 budget and 22-23 forecast was related to the federal provincial programs we just um, okay. spoke about. So they were, they didn't get started more or less till um, December, January. So that was a partial year of savings due to that. Um, and then the change from budget to budget also relates to the federal provincial program. Um, so there's an adjustment required based on the contribution agreement. I believe it had to do with the flood hazard mapping. Thank you very much, Chair. So these numbers should now remain relatively consistent moving forward? Well, the, they're made up of federal provincial, not all of them, but in mm -hmm. a lot of cases made up of federal provincial funding agreements. So to the extent that perhaps those funding agreements are extended beyond March 31st of 2024, then, you know, we would take our cue from that. Leader of the opposition. Uh, salaries. So again, there was an underspend and now going into this year, there's a budget for, for more. So the underspend would probably be, um, Almost, well, over 200, no, over 100,000, mm -hmm. and the increase would be probably 146,000, let's say. Mm -hmm. So, was there some vacancies last year and some new hires this year? And if there were new hires, how many? What were they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were vacancies. We had three new positions planned for last year, and so they did not get staffed until relatively recently. So, that's the explanation for the forecast variance from last year's budget to last year's forecast. And uh, in the coming year, we have the new Departmental Climate Change Coordinator position, and then we also have collective bargaining adjustments. Um, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. I was going to follow up a bit on the uh, National Disaster Emergency Resiliency Grant that was used to buy uh, generators for fire departments. Can you tell me how many generators that bought? I want to say it was over 700. Right. Leader, they're birdie. Thank you. Can you tell us how those were distributed amongst the fire departments? I would have to bring that information back. Okay. Yeah. Leader, the third party. Uh, just in general terms, you know, if it was done on a, like, does each department, each fire department got the same number or was it depending on the the size of the fire area that they were covering? Yeah, that's more detail than I have, so I'll, I'll bring that as, back as well. Okay. Chair. Leader, third party. And is there funding in place to, like, presumably those generators will be held at fire stations and uh, for, uh, until they're needed. Um, is there ongoing operational funds in place to maintain those generators and make sure that when they are needed, they're ready to go and they are properly maintained? There's no funding in that budget to do that. Okay. It is a good point, though. Yeah. So, leave that with you. Leave the third party. Yeah. Uh, how, having turned over 700 generators, are we keeping track of where they are, or is that up to the individual fire departments to, to keep an inventory of what they've got? Yes, as a grant, they would be expected to maintain the, um, the inventory directly. As if it was a government property, uh, we would have to maintain the inventory, but as a grant, that's not the case. Okay. Leave the third party. I'm good for this, thank you. Uh, my list is exhausted. Shall the section carry? Very, very Total Climate Action Secretariat, 357000 shall carry. Environment and Water, Division Management, Appropriations provided for the Management and Administration of the Environment and Water Division, Administration 8700 Equipment 1000 Material Supplies and Services 2600 Professional Services 50000 Salaries 350800 Travel and Training 6400 Grants 15400 Total division management, 434,900. Shall the section carry? Uh, leader of the third party. When will the irrigation strategy be finished? Question. 
So I was online yesterday. Sorry, uh, they're, they're that's very... all right. Checking out the really useful website that we have now attached to uh, water management here on the Good on area. the. It's amazing. Yeah. Except it was down yesterday because yeah. of the. <laughs> But I have been there before, so I'm aware of how good the information is, how useful that is. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell us, because there's some open data there, but most of it is not, um, how, how you plan on increasing the amount of open data that's available on that website? Sure, I'll open it all up if I can. I, yeah, I'm a model for open data. So I'll go back and find out how, how we can do it, but I'm key to open it all up. Right. Leader of the third party. Can you tell us how many water extraction permits, that's not the right word, water withdrawal permits have been issued since the moratorium was lifted? I know it, but I can't remember it. Do yeah, that? I don't have that information. We okay. can bring that back. Well, that not be... huge, but I, I'll bring it back. Yeah, I, no, I'm, I'm I talked so about it the other day, but I can't, I wouldn't want to say the wrong number. Okay. Leader of the third party. And the monitoring of uh, those new wells, that's that's the uh, responsibility of the individual farmer, is that correct? To provide the data, to know that we're not overdrawing from a particular watershed? I think we're still, I'll have to bring that back, but I think we're still um, measuring it. Okay. But I'll confirm that for sure. All right. We'll do the third party. Um, and as the, the number of these wells increase, and I mean, particularly in a drought situation like now, I mean, we know the first priority is for firefighting. That's, you know, we have, has to be there for that. Um, but I'm, I'm wondering whether the, there's going to be extra cost to the department if we are tasked with monitoring these new wells. And I know there's, well, I don't know how many there are, but I'm not surprised it's not a huge number. But is that reflected in extra funding here for the department in order to monitor that? Um, I don't think it is at this point. Yeah, not at this point. That's the next section, water and air monitoring, and there's no related funding for that okay. for monitoring. We haven't had an increase of need yet, though, either. Okay. These are the third party. And if we finalize that government governance structure for, uh, uh, for monitoring water withdrawals, not monitoring for water withdrawals, like because I know it's going to be on a, like a local watershed, watershed by watershed basis. That yeah. was the plan, anyway. Yeah, I'll have to bring that back. I know the conversations I've talked about this last year, but we're looking at trying to get all of water dealt with in one area and make it arm's length so that it's more transparency and so it's a goal of mine to get it to the point where it's in a trusted place where people can feel confident that, not that I don't want them to have confidence in government, but I know people sometimes don't. So I'd like to take it out somewhere where it's beyond the influence of government so that no one can say it's being influenced irregularly. Leave the third party. Right, so I, I take it from that minister, we haven't finalized what that's the structure of that and what it's going to look like and who's going to be on it? Uh, no. That independent board we're talking about. Okay. Yeah. The third party. Any sense of when that that will be in place? I wish now, like, I, but that's how I treat all my files. So it's a, I'll get a, a better answer than that for you. But I mean, uh, it's urgent for me to complete some of these things. Right. Leave the third party. Thank you, and I I agree with you that independence and arm's length is critical in this instance and well in many places but particularly here and I'm, so if it's going to be arm's length I'm wondering how that's going to be funded will that be through a grant from you know a budget appropriation or will it be through permits cost of permits that the individuals will be bringing we would probably fund it I mean there there wouldn't be enough permits I don't think to cover it all because we we're looking at wastewater too and okay. water wastewater groundwater um, surface water like all of our waters to put them in under now that we have this the act, it's easier to protect. So it's easier to push out arms length because we have the protections in place anyways, literally. Right. right. I'm good for this section, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa Perry, and thank you for always bringing it back to the budget as well, uh, Leah. Uh, shall the section carry? Water and air monitoring appropriations provided to administer and issue high capacity well approvals 
air quality permits, conduct air quality monitoring, undertake groundwater and surface water quality and quantify monitoring, and prepare groundwater and surface water reports. Administration 17,300, equipment 45,700, material supplies and services 59,500, professional services 174,000, salaries 1,140,700, travel and training 68,400, grants 160,000, total water and air monitoring 1,665,600. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Uh, to me, the budget line that sort of jumps out at you is the grants from last year, which you know was budgeted. by well, the estimate was a hundred thousand. The forecast was almost two million. I'm just wondering what what the explanation for that is. The province has entered in a five-year contract with UPEI to conduct research on sustainable agriculture and water use. Oh. Leader of the third party. Okay. So is that? You know, close to two million dollars. Is that the first installment of a five-year uh, project? Like, are we expecting to see that again? I see it's down to one hundred and sixty thousand this year. So, is that just a once-off payment? Uh, there, I can't recall whether it was fiscal twenty-two, uh, sorry, twenty-one, twenty-two, or twenty twenty-one where it began. But that would be the bulk of of the um, of the project. And we have, I believe, for the next two to three years, $60,000 per year that's in this budget as well. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Can you tell us what work they're doing, Kelly, with that, what, what services yeah. UPEI is providing for us? Um, the purpose is to demonstrate the impact of irrigation on groundwater levels and the impact irrigation can have on nutrient application, yield, and greenhouse gas reduction. Leader of the third party. Okay. Um, and is that is that the one where they were going to do three test sites and monitor them over time? Okay, all right. And is that chair? Sorry, uh, members. Is, is can that you just say uh, yes or no rather than nodding so that Hanser can pick up the response to the question? Yes. Thank you, <laughs> leader of the third party. Uh, and how many years did you say? Five years is the length that that study is going to go. Yeah, I believe it's five years. It might have extended into a sixth, but um, it's five to six years. Okay. Leader of the third party. So this is a separate study from, because I know part of the, uh, all of the conversations around the development of the Water Act and consequently the regulations were, uh, there was an emphasis on the importance of having watershed by watershed data available to us because to, although as one aquifer, there, there are significant differences between them. But this is not the work that's being done. I think that's been done by through UPEI as well to give us that data for watershed by watershed quality and quantity analysis. No, that, that would be unrelated, yes. So where would I find the, the cost of that? There's nothing specific for UPEI in here other than, than that one project. So I would have to go back and speak with the manager about okay. sort of where, how he has that funded. He may have it funded within budget, that, but just not that clearly identifiable. Okay. Leader, third party. So it may not sit with UPEI. That was my assumption. I apologize, Kelly, for, for, for that. Um, so that, that work to make sure that we do have up-to-date, accurate data on each watershed across the province. That's a, bit, that's a lot of work. So we have a large number of watersheds. And I'm wondering where, this is the section on water monitoring, where, we, where I would expect to find the cost of that. It may be within, within this section. It's just not identifiable in my materials. So I'll, I'll go back to the program manager and discuss that with him and bring that back. Leave the third party. Okay. Is there, I just, I don't see any, I mean, the bulk of this, uh, of the, of the uh, budget in this section is for salaries. Mm -hmm. um, and, I mean, there would be some, some human resources, of course, apply to this, but I suspect there would be big grants too. Is there any other plausible place in the budget where we would find enough money t to cover that work? Not that's not already dedicated to other items, so... I'll, I'll have to bring more information back. Okay. Leave the third party. Yeah, can I just confirm, though, that that work is ongoing, that the commitment to gather and maintain watershed by watershed data on quantity and quality is, is part of um, a safe 
uh, water registry plan that we have going forward. Yeah, we do collect. We know we do collect it. That's why that the dashboard is capable right. of providing you the, the data as we do have it by watershed. But I'll get okay. you. We'll bring back a better answer, I guess, right. if that doesn't satisfy. Okay. Leader of the third party. So it's water and air monitoring. I'll move on to air monitoring now. And I'm, you know, there was a lot of, has been a lot of talk recently about air quality, of course, because of the smoke from the fires that's been drifting all over the place. And I'm wondering if there are any, if we're doing any monitoring here on Prince Edward Island specifically related to um, particulate matter from forest fires. No, I don't know, but we can bring that information back. Okay. Lead it there. Pretty? Uh, we get, I think, pretty good data from Environment Canada on uh, particulate matter. And I know, I know that they have, uh, as they do with the weather forecast, they have something that they, that they bring out on air quality as well. And I haven't seen any issues on PEI at all. I don't think it's, it's gone above two or three the whole time. Um, but will we be doing any monitoring and collecting data above and beyond what we get from Environment Canada? As far as monitoring um, go, we, we do have funding in this budget for a review of the air, um, of the air quality regulations in fiscal 20, uh, sorry, I think it was in 22-23. Yes, we do, to update the air quality regulations um, through uh, a consultant so that you would, that will result in changes to the regulations in 23-24 potentially. Okay. Leader of the third party. Uh, can I just check that um, indoor air quality monitoring, is that an expense that would be found here or is that somewhere else? I believe that would probably be health and wellness through the to public health office. Okay. Right. I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Drinking water and wastewater management, appropriations provided to administer approvals, regulatory compliance, and protection related to water wells, drinking water, and wastewater systems, and for the administration of the Water Act regulations, including well construction, water quality investigations, and other related services. Administration, 8,500. Equipment, 13,000. Material supplies and services, 8,900. Professional services, 7,000. Salaries, 550,000. Travel and training, 37,100. Total drinking water and wastewater wastewater management six hundred twenty four thousand five hundred. Are there any questions in this section? We have a third party. Um, so, what, if any, role does the department play in monitoring uh, it, wastewater testing for COVID nineteen? Because that seems to be a place that we look to for yeah. useful data on that. Yeah. Yes, we do have an agreement in partnership with the Department of Health and Wellness to support, we have to actually facilitate the, the monitoring and the testing, and the Department of Health and Wellness has an agreement with the federal government. So we are partners on that agreement. Okay. We, that was 22-23, and I believe may be extended into 23-24. Okay. Leave the third party. So can you tell me what, the, what role the, the, the Department of Environment plays in that process? I, we facilitate um, the collection with the operators, the wastewater operators, that would pretty much be our, our because we have the, the relationship with the wastewater operators, so that would be our part uh, in supporting that agreement. Okay. Leave the third party. And I'm wondering, Mr. Fairley, when, when this was first announced as a way of measuring the prevalence of uh, COVID-19 in the community, I was sort of blown away that that's something that would give you any sort of useful or accurate figures, but it certainly appears that that's the case. It's certainly used widely. And I'm wondering if there are any plans to expand that sort of wastewater testing to monitor for other illnesses. I mean, this is obviously the pandemic was a, was a particular situation, but is it a useful technology for other diseases? I think that's probably best addressed by the Department of Health and Wellness. Okay. Leave the third party. 
And what's the approximate cost to, you, to the your department for conducting this wastewater water testing? There was no cost to us. We simply facilitated, and any cost we recovered through the Department of Health and Wellness. Okay. Leave the third party. Uh, can you detail what compliance activities take place under this section to monitor water quality? And does, it, does the province have oversight over municipal um, water utilities, or, are they, or, do, or do they manage themselves? There certainly is an oversight function, yes, um, over utilities. Yeah. We have the third party. And, and what is that, Kelly? Um, the approval of engin engineering design and operation of all central water and wastewater systems, including administrative functions as overseeing operator certification and facility classification programs. Leave the third party. Okay. And we recently completed a big project um, between Stratford and Charlottetown to the wastewater system there. Can you, uh, any sense of whether that's working as we had hoped, whether there was sufficient capacity on this side of the Hillsborough Bridge to, to take that? I mean, I'm sure all those studies were done, but I'm just wondering where we are. I would have to bring that back from the unit, yes. Okay. Leave the third part. I am good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Sure. Sure. Microbiology and Chemistry Laboratories, appropriations provided for the microbiological and chemical analysis of drinking water, surface water, and wastewater, administration 47,700, equipment 33,500, material supplies and services 297,500, professional services 10,500, salaries 1,035,700, travel and training 4,100, total microbiology and chemistry laboratories 1,429,000. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Chair. Um, so here, I see these salaries. There's, there's an increase in salaries. Is there a new, was there a new position uh, created? Not one new position. This was to annualize the um, additional positions that we added last year um, related to the free residential water testing. Leader of the Opposition. I was going to go there. So the, have you seen, has that lab seen uh, a huge or any increase in the amount of uh, water testing over the years prior to it being free? Um, I have drinking water tests between 2021, there yep. was about 14,800. Yep. 2122, 19,800. <clears throat> and 2223, 22,900. Leave it That's awesome. I'm glad people are taking advantage of it. Good, Jared. Good yeah, job. Yeah, it's a good job. Uh, so uh, I do have to uh, thank, again, the Department of Environment and the leadership here for cooperation in, in putting that out. So I, uh, I do in, in, uh, appreciate that, and I'm glad that there has been such a huge uptake. And that's all my questions for this one. All right, members, we will uh, now shift to a time other than government. That's good. That's good. Yes. Mr. Chair, I move the speaker take the chair and the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall it carry? Madam Speaker, I'm well. Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Committee on the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress and begs to leave to sit again. I move the report of the Committee be adopted. Shall carry. Carry. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria, or sorry, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At this time, the official opposition calls motion 35. Shall carry. Carry. Motion 35. Member for Charlottetown West Royalty moves, seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition, the following motion. 
Whereas mental health is a critical component of overall health and well-being, and access to quality mental health care is necessary for all individuals to live healthy and fulfilling lives. <coughs> and whereas universal mental health care means the services needed are available, are publicly funded, and free to the individual, and they are the same no matter where a person lives or who they are. And whereas cost should not get in the way of access to mental health care. And whereas mental health conditions impact, <coughs> impacts many islanders and families, and access to mental health care services often falls short in meeting the needs of vulnerable and marginalized populations. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly calls on the government to give consideration to implementing universal mental health care. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to rise and talk about this, uh, talk to this important motion, which I'm, um, which, um, I think it presents an opportunity for us all to, to reflect on, on our own mental health and the, the mental health of the people that we represent and, and how we can make it better and how we can use this chamber to, to work towards a common good. And that's, that's um, something transformative. And it, it, it really shouldn't be when you look at it from the outside. Um, you know, there's countless lives in our society and, and that, that struggle with their mental health. And when you struggle with your mental health, your family struggles. And, and when your family struggles, everybody's concerned about one or two or, or everybody's well-being. You know, we don't have to look much further back in time than, than, than COVID to, to realize that we were all worried about somebody in our circle somewhere. Um, and not knowing what to do or how to get through to them. And, and uh, you know, using technology was good, um, but it was... It was tough on a lot of people. And I guess, you know, it's, it's funny because during that time, I, I mean, as, as uh, an MLA, I, I didn't know what to do for people's mental health. And I, was, I just didn't, didn't know, but I knew I wanted to help. And I did the only thing I could do. And what I knew how to do was just do fitness classes and exercise videos and put on some music in my living room and, and embarrass myself on, on Facebook for a hundred days in a row, um, but you know it's it was it was interesting because it was at two thirty in the afternoon. We picked that time. We formed a group. We formed. Uh, we do forty or fifty minutes. It was there. It was up there for everybody. But the, it wasn't for about the exercise. It wasn't about. It wasn't anything more than just trying to get through to people to let them know that people are out there struggling, to have a few jokes. We went through, we went through different times together. We went through uh, the RCMP shootings in Nova Scotia during that time. We talked about those things. We went through a lot of different things and we talked about it every day. And that's what we can do. That's what we all do in our communities, whether it's j just to be there to support people. But coming out of COVID, now that we're out of COVID, people are, people, some people are left behind. And we have to make sure that we're, we're moving forward and that care and services are there for everybody. Um, mental health is a, is a fundamental aspect of individuals' well-being. Um, di directly influence you know, how they live and contribute to society. And to, to reach full potential, it's there. The universal mental health system will affect the people on the margins of society the most. The people that can't afford mental health coverage, private coverage, they need the service but it's not, it's not available for them. They get left behind. And that's why a program like this is very important. I mean, talking to different people in the community, there's examples of this during COVID when people have come to our our, um, our tiny island during COVID, and they don't know to, that everybody else on the island watches Compass or listens to the radio. They don't see that. So something's going on that's, that's massive, but they don't get the information. And then something happens, or they might break a rule or something, and, and, and then before you know it, they're, in, they're in, uh, in, a, in a predicament, and they're very scared. They're here alone. So it's things like that that we have to be there. And these are how how we look at mental health challenges as a universal and as a whole. Mental health care <clears throat> is not a luxury. Um, it's a fundamental right. It's a human right at this time 
to make sure that we're moving everybody together collectively, whether they're, they're, um, whether they're here, whether they're having mental health problems, we don't leave people behind in our society. You know, we have to provide them with the care that they need. And we must extend, you know, the same supports an individual struggling with mental health and because it affects their well-being. No one should have to battle their inner demons alone or suffer in silence due to a lack of resources. Our duty as a compassionate society is to ensure that no one gets left behind. Through this motion, I present a vision for an island that acknowledges the significance of mental health and takes concrete steps to provide universal access to mental health care services. It's time to break down the barriers that, that prevent people from seeking help, dismantle the stigmas around mental health, and create a system that is inclusive, supportive, and accessible to all. And that's really our goal. We have, we witness this, we witness this every day and more and more Islanders are struggling with this. And COVID accentuated again that, those things because it provided an extra uh, pressure on people at different types in their lives. There's still people that we talk to and we've, we've gone to the doors and you, you remember them that, that a lot of them, ha some of them haven't even really been out. They haven't been out, they, they have their routine and they, they go out and it was, it really affected people in different ways. You know, we take for granted that in, even in this chamber, um, we can sit beside our colleague, uh, like uh, uh, a hand away from everybody. These, these desks were all separated and we did, we were, we were scared in here. That's an example of something small in here, but on the outside, you, you had, you had people walking down, walking down grocery aisles and, you know, and there was an etiquette. There was an edit, we had, we had, that, that wasn't too far ago in our society. That affects people's mental health. So let's, let's look how we come out of, let's look how we come out of this together and, and, and keep working, working towards a universal system. Um, we see in our society that we're seeking consultation with healthcare professionals at alarming rate. 20% of Islanders now seeking health professional consultation. That was around 9% in 2015, so it's up to 20%. So, so these are concerning numbers. Islanders have also faced more pressing issues when it comes to suicidal thoughts, with more than 10% of Islanders having suicidal thoughts. And that was way before COVID. I've talked in this legislature about barriers on the, the Hillsborough Bridge and spoken passionately and, and watched suicide rip through families and, and you know, ha have discussions and, and tough conversations with people and tough issues in here, are we doing enough? And that's what the importance of this motion is, is that we need to do better at preparation. If you prepare yourself, you destroy the excuses on the other end. And with this, we, we can make no exceptions about how, how we proceed as legislators in here. And we have to take this seriously, and we're, we're fighting an uphill battle because the, the, the mental health of people is not always visible, but, but it hurts deeply, and how they respond to that will affect their lives and futures. So we have to look at some of these things, and, and that, like I said before, it only gets magnified on the marginalized communities and how their mental health gets affected, not to have the services provided by somebody <clears throat> who, who might be resemble you or be with you is, is, is very is very difficult in a new place sometimes in a new place we're here for them and our colleges and, and universities have done a good job with their mental health care programming but there's a long way to get in and the access is the access might be there are like things like you'll call up and you'll be like well I can get you in next week we have to do better with both our colleges and universities. And I know that the government, they gave some more money for that directly. I think two years ago, maybe, I watched that number. I think it was $25,000. But it can't be a, a one-time thing. It, it, can't be, it can't be just, here's a little bit of money. I want to know that this money helped people. And do we need to give more? Do we have to, we have to be there for people as our population grows and as people 
need the service more and more. And our professionals here who do the work do an incredible amount of work with this. But the whole problem is they're stressed and there's, there's a lack of professionals to do this work. Investing in universal health care is more imperative and sound economic decisions and untreated mental health conditions result in significant uh, economic losses ranging from decreased work, workplace uh, productivity and you know it, it just costs more in our health care system. So these are all, these are all things that we're, we have to look at and, 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 and take, uh, take into consideration. Just in the Peachy Report, I want to talk about the Peachy Report for just a brief second. And that's called the Provincial Clinical and Preventative Service Planning for PEI. And that just came out. And it should give us a, a roadmap to where our, where our weaknesses are. And the section on mental health, it's, it starts to talk about the Hillsborough Hospital. It's a 64-bed facility, but only 42 beds are open. So you think about that. We're not, we, 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 we have the beds, but we can't, again, we can't staff them, so we're down to 42 beds. Once we move there, how do we get back? How do we, are we, are we investing in that when we need to? When we have, when we have issues around um, Unit 9 being closed during COVID and, and not opening properly, and now it's a, it's a day programs, and day programs are replacing uh, inpatient facilities. I don't know if that's the best approach. I'm worried about that approach, and I'm not making any, trying to make any of this political, and it's a decision that would be need, but as the mental health critic, I have to, uh, I, get, I get an alarm. I get an alarm to say, hey, you know what? Is this a human resource issue? If it's a human resource issue now and our population's growing, where are we gonna be in two or three years? Does 64 open beds at Hillsborough Hospital go down to 32 beds? What, what's stopping us from doing that and who doesn't get the service? So these are all, these are all things that, 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 that worry, that worry uh, me as the critic and I, I want to make sure that we keep moving, we keep moving forward and we keep working together on this. Um, we should have 20 psychiatrists but only have 10 in our province. That's according to the Peachy Report. There are, there are 10 FTEs, psychiatrists, six are at the QEH and four are at the PCH. We have half the complement. However, the complement is 20. So we're, that, that to me says, wow, we, we've, got, we've got 10, we're missing, we're missing 10 out of the mental health system. How can we, how can we sustain care, or what are we doing to the 10, 10 that we have that work very hard that could use another 10? These are the things, these are the things that are important. Characteristics of Prince Edward Island psychiatric care can be summarized. Uh, the two psychiatrists are retiring over the next two years. Three to five psychiatrists provide telehealth services to Prince Edward Island. Two to three psychiatrists provide one-on-one -on -one consultation. Inpatients are covered well, but outpatients must less, much less well. So if you're in, if you're in, you get great coverage. If you're just visiting, you don't get great coverage. But instead of having 64 beds, we have 42. So there, you, can't, you can't get into the system where you can get good coverage. But if you're just coming through and you, you maybe need to be in there and you're out in the streets, you do not get great coverage. So these are, this is from the Peachy Report again. Um, On-call coverage is, is uh, provincial while pediatric psych, psychiatry is largely telehealth. Pediatric psychiatry is largely telehealth. W what does that say to what we're doing for our children when they need the service? There's only one FTE for geriatric psychiatry. That's our, that's our senior population. We have to start to look at these things. Um, and it goes on and on to, to outline to us where our, where our weaknesses are, where our weaknesses are. And we have to make sure we get these numbers in line so that we can have a robust universal system. 
So that's just a summary, that's like a, that's a summary to say, hey, this is where our province is. Where we need to get to is not gonna be easy, but everybody deserves the same quality. Universal mental health care system, what does it mean? The services you need are available to you. The services you need are available to you. They are free and funded through our public health care system. And they are the same no matter where you live or who you are, they meet your needs. The care provider recognizes that people from different communities have specific needs. We, we need to work towards a, this exact principles and this is what it means to have a universal mental health care system. And we're not there, but the next four years, I hope that we can work together to get there. It covers services that range from keeping people well and out of crisis to helping them on their path to recovery and everything in between. And as I mentioned before about COVID and the, the detrimental effect that's had on our mental health as a society, children, youth, young adults, are dealing with a range of pressures, a range of pressures. You think about it in, in, in junior high, what the pressures are right now on, on children in high school, what the pressures are. It's, it's, we're, putting in a, we're putting in new legislation and uh, the Minister of Education has brought forward important stuff around cyberbullying. And that's very, very, very important. But for us, looking back at our childhood, is that something that we had to deal with? And how, if, if we were being cyber bullied, how, how would we take that home? How would we go to school and get up the next day after being cyber bullied? And what that would do to our mental health? That's just, it wasn't there. And we we're having trouble policing it and monitoring it. So these are the things that affect our mental health. Um, and you could say the same thing, maybe seniors aren't being, aren't being uh, cyber bullied, but they went through COVID and they paid attention and that could be a mental health stressor on them. And their experience and on the senior level and anybody with, with, um, with, with places in their district, like I think of Huntington Court and, and there's some people that I don't know why, but they watch every day, but they're there watching and they're watching the proceedings and they're, they're asking about the $5 co-pays and they're asking about things that affect them and diabetes yeah, diabetes is, is yeah, that, diabetes, uh, the, 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 they need more supports for diabetes and, um, the, and that when the minister, one of the ministers and I have talked about it for work, workforce and these are the things that are concerning that and they just want to live in, in, in peace and, and, you know, and get the services needed but they're, they're, they, they show signs of depression and anxiety. We cannot forget about the people in our, in our facilities uh, that are just trying to live the good life. So get in there, make sure you visit them and have, have your parties and, and whatnot in there and, they, and they'll just love it. Don't forget about their mental health. Um, it's challenging on PEI to access the public system in mental health care. And these are, these are important. If you can afford it, you can get private care. You can get private care. If you can't afford it, public's gonna be very, very difficult to attain. And I'm not talking about just in Charlottetown. I went, and, I went up to Montague and, and, and talked to uh, a group of kids in, in, in Montague and um, they had a work program and, and uh, we chatted and you know what, the one thing that they talked about at the end was, was they don't have access to the mental health care services in Montague that they, that they want. And, they were, that was very, very important to them. And it doesn't, it doesn't just stop there. It's all, it's all across the province. And rural PEI is there's, there's less services um, in rural PEI and we need to do better at that as well. It's, it's, it's imperative that we work on this together all throughout our island. Canadian Mental Health Association says, they, they say it very well on this topic. Many of us can't afford to pay for services like counseling, psychotherapy, eat, eating disorder treatments, <clears throat> substance use and addiction treatments, and only some have access to these services through their private health care insurance plan. This is from CMHA. Costs shouldn't get in the way of care. 
and that's why we need a universal system. Everyone should be able to get the supports they need, whoever they are, wherever they live, whatever they need. Universal mental health care would not only reduce overall health care costs and other social costs, but it's essential for our well-being, for our well-being. I'm not going to get into starting to talk about wellness in this whole session where I've been here for three weeks and there's so many pressing issues I can't even talk about wellness. So people's well-being comes from being well. And we talk about, we talk about all we've been talking about is access to care. But, but the minister knows as well as I do that the proactive line of things has to be looked at, has to be looked at as well. And that's separate from this line, which, which is eating up the budget, which is it, it's just constantly there. It's always going to be there. But unless we move forward with our wellness plan and our wellness goal, we need a wellness strategy, we are, we are stuck both giving primary care and mental health care. And these are things that I, I look forward to working on for the next four years. And let's hit the ground running. And there are some good little, little tickets of things in, in the budget in here. And, you know, the federal government recently agreed to provide the province $288 million um, for a very long time to work on four different areas. And one of them is mental health. And that, that money has to be well spent. And it has to be things looking at this through both the finance minister um, and the, the minister of health to say, hey, you know what, what would happen if we invested more in mental health, if we, if we did this and we provided access to care before it escalated into something else? And these, these are incredibly important, incredibly important topics I'm bringing up. Um, ER service, if the, it's reported as around 30% of patients at the ER are there for mental health concerns. 30% of the patients that, are, that report to the ER are there for 30. What happened this weekend? The, the, the ER said, don't come in here, it's a 15 hour wait. Mm -hmm. Like at, 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 the one, at the one hospital that a number of different things are happening, guess what's happening to the QEH? There's no other place to go. What do you do? What do you do when you hear messaging that'll affect your mental health? Because we have said as a society, don't come here. We are too full. That's the last place Islanders can go. That's it. And 30% are presenting there with mental health concerns. So it should say something that the ER is full. We have what I would have done as if I was a minister, which I'm not, I would have said the ER is full. What we've done is we set up a six hour clinic here that people can go to if you wanted to go to the ER instead. Or a mental health clinic. If you have mental health concerns, we're setting up this clinic because the ER is full. Give us an option. Give us something else. And that would be, that would be something that you can do. You can go to Health PEI and say, why don't, we, why don't we just, instead of saying, nope, here, let's give them something else. And that's needed because you don't know if, if, if one of those people needs the mental health support at that time and they can't go there, they can't be there. So it, it's, things like, it's things like this and, and, and just, I've um, only got a couple more examples, but um, you know, you look at Serene View, Serene View Ranch, uh, it's a private provider, was serving 60 islands with 60 islanders with complex mental health needs. To my knowledge, the province no longer covers that cost of treatment for these 60 islanders. And I hope the minister stands up and corrects me on that for some reason or something. If, 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 I, if I got my data wrong, please correct me. But this is a good example of why we need a universal health care system. We can't do that. We, we can't rely. We have to rely on everybody as a whole and make this universal. And I understand 
what's going to be said and hopefully we'll be excited about some of the answers, but setting up a, a, a mental health emergency room beside the QEH, I hope it works, but we don't know if it'll work. We don't know if people presenting there with chest pains just get sent to the ER and back. I'm not sure how that's going to work. We have to do more and we have to get universally together on this because people are slipping through the cracks. So um, I look forward to hearing about any anything that you've experienced. We need to do this for our constituents. We need to do this for Islanders. And it's something that's going to take time. But if we did it, to, if we do it together, talk about these in committee, talk about these here on the floor of the legislature, maybe we can make change together. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I rise to second this very important and uh, timely motion today, and I want to thank the member from Charlottetown West Royalty for bringing this forward. Um, and uh, as he said, we, we need to be there for our fellow Islanders in their time of need. Uh, we are failing many of our fellow citizens when it comes to their mental health well-being. It equates to a moral imperative that we act on this issue. Timely access to quality mental health care is necessary for all individuals to live healthy and fulfilling lives that can contribute to society. It's a fundamental right that must, right that must be in place. So I stand here today urging the government to implement a universal mental health care service. People need the leadership of this House and the actions of this government to shine as an example. To invest in the mental well-being of our citizens by giving them universal access. Universal coverage is needed because people are simply unable to access the treatment they need. In many cases, they simply cannot afford it. Uh, to visit a counselor in this province today, it will cost an individual about $100 a session. Now, this is no small cost. And if you talk to mental health professionals, they will tell you on a, uh, that one session is not enough. It takes several appointments to understand the scope and the dynamics of an individual and the issues at play before it can be addressed in different ways. One recently told me it may take as many as five different sessions before they feel comfortable in offering a path forward. And that's at a minimum. Some people need sustained support for some time. This means people are facing as much as $500 out of pocket before there is any breakthrough or diagnosis to, it, to address. So following this, there, there may be medications involved also or, or additional services required. And all of this is an added cost. Much like a, a visit to a, do, a, to a doctor, you may need to come back for a checkup or you may need to be monitored uh, for continued improvement. Um, so the doctor is covered by our universal um, healthcare system while the counselor or the uh, psychologist is not. The government believes physical ailments require um, universal care, but mental ailments, uh, basically you're on your own here in this province. So a government support, what government supports are in place uh, to help people here on the island? So virtually there's none, Madam Speaker, unless you have private insurance or a strong uh, work benefit program, you have to find the money to pay for this service here on Prince Edward Island. If you don't have the money, you simply do not get the treatment. So what does that say about our society here in this province? What kind of message does this say to someone who is struggling with anxiety, depression, and possibly contemplating suicide? A recent coroner's inquest called out the need for greater monitoring of PEI res residents who suffer from chronic mental illness and for improvements in the system. Now this was following a, a a murder-suicide of a mother and a nine-year-old. It was a horrifying story that, that even saddens me to mention it. So this is unreal, it's heartbreaking, and honestly, we're letting people down, Madam Speaker. How did something like this happen? Where were the services that, that she needed? We need services in place to at least mitigate against such a terrible incident such as that. Without services, treatable mental health issues grow. They worsen. Just like a physical ail ailment, without treatment, you simply get worse. Universal care ensures every Islander can access the care needed. It removes the affordability barrier and opens the door to everyone, regardless of background, regardless of the size of their paycheck, 
or the quality of benefits that their employer can afford. So I know members of this house agree. We all know someone who has suffered from anxiety, depression, or other mental ailments that can or had, that requires care. Maybe it was your sibling or a friend, or even yourself, Madam Speaker. Maybe they got the help that they needed, but maybe they were unable to get that help. So this motion, universal care, ensures everyone is given the opportunity to seek help, to get care, to prevent further harm to themselves or others. It's a real issue affecting real people in every district across this province. So I'm encouraging the government to do the right thing and invest in them. Let's remove the affordability barrier and deliver this fundamental right to islanders by providing free and timely mental health care services in this province. I urge all of you to vote with your conscience on this motion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I would like to thank the member from Charlottetown West Royalty for bringing forward this um, really, really important motion. I think that it makes perfect sense as we consider that there is no difference between physical and mental health. If we don't have our physical health, we're not healthy. If we don't have our mental health, we're not healthy. So this just makes perfect sense. There are so many families who are struggling right now. And, and I guess my mind, while I see this, of course, being for all Islanders, I see this being a really crucial step to take in early intervention and prevention to support children. As we consider the fact that there really is no place to go unless you have money. Um, we used to have more services offered like through the Catholic Family Services Bureau where they would offer sliding scale for families who couldn't afford it. They would offer play therapy and music therapy, which we know are two of the most effective therapies for children that we can offer. And, and we don't have that anymore. And then as was mentioned, our funding, the government funding to Serene View Ranch was cut and we lost that too. Where some of the counselors who had been offering that sliding scale had moved and continued to offer that sliding scale for families. And that, while that service is still there, the government funding has been cut. And this was providing such crucial service to families. Um, one of the things that I found most disturbing while I was helping a family navigate through the services and trying to get some mental health supports for their child was the fact that their child would often go into violent, um, they would have violent spurts. And the only way for them to move forward was to get child protection involved. This was not a child protection issue. This was a protection, or sorry, this was a child who was struggling with mental health issues, who needed interventions. And why would we, why would we put that unnecessary stress and embarrassment on families when that is not the issue? And so making this a universal program would take the stigma away because it shows the stigma that still, still exists for mental health care within government. It shows the complete lack of understanding of what is needed when delivering mental health care services. When we have something like that still in our process for families to get help, it just doesn't make any sense. Some of the lowest hanging fruit that we have here as a province. So, I'll say this again, but accessibility supports grew to include mental health supports, which I would give a standing ovation to, until I found out that, nope, that doesn't include mental health counseling or counseling therapy services. That's absurd. We know that that is the most effective way for many people. It's not the most effective way for everyone, but it is one of the best practices that we can do to support people with their mental health is through talk therapy, play therapy, music therapy. That's proven and it's known. Yet, when I was helping a few different, it happened to be moms in these cases who were advocating for their children, who were approved through the Accessibility Supports Program and they were just thrilled to have money for mental health counseling, only to find out, no, we don't cover mental health counseling. So you can put that money towards something else, but it can't be counseling. So under the Accessibility Supports Program, unless it's changed, and I would be thrilled to hear any news that there may be, um, under the Accessibility Supports Program, 
if your child, so you're seeking mental health counseling, one of the, the families I was working with, their child had been so traumatized. And as a province, we would treat the behavior that this trauma led to, but we wouldn't treat the root cause. So we just keep putting Band-Aids on this mental health issue. Rather than continuing the support for this child who was at Serene View Ranch, who had developed, as was mentioned by the leader of the opposition, developed a wonderful relationship over a really long amount of time. Because as a counselor, the most important thing that, the most crucial step, the only way forward is to develop a healthy, relation, healthy trusting relationship with your client, in this case, would be a child. And that takes a really long time. And it's a precious relationship. And when you're constantly pulling children out from that and expecting them to start new, that also shows a complete lack of understanding of what it takes to treat mental health. Because we're still expecting people that it's no big deal. Oh, well, we're not going to fund them. We're going to fund this over here now. So you can just take your child there. That is a complete lack of empathy, a complete lack of understanding of what this child has gone through already. And you're contributing to that trauma when you expect a child, and I know I keep talking about kids, but that's where I am right now, when you don't consider the impacts of that on their mental health. And so when I found out in the beginning that accessibility supports did not cover um, counseling services, I immediately got to work with the former Minister of Social Development and Housing, and he also thought it was absurd um, and thought perhaps it should be covered under health, so let's involve the former Health and Wellness Minister, so that is what we did. And then it just died in the water. So what is it? Why are we not doing this? What barrier did the former health minister and the former social development and housing minister run into? I, could, I still can't get an answer to that question. I don't know what it is. It seems absurd from this side of the house what it could possibly be, whether it be a lack of staff, whatever, that's kind of ridiculous because why wouldn't we just move ahead with this? Because it's the right thing to do, and we know that. Evidence shows us that. Kids tell us that, adults tell us that. So any excuse we have, or any, sorry, that isn't the right word I'm looking for, but any barrier that we've seen, let's talk about that. Because from this side of the house, that one um, thing where no one's communicating to me on what's happening tells me that it's just dead in the water, but for what reason? Give us a reason. This is important. And we don't have enough mental health supports in our schools. And government knows this is important because one of the line items in the um, throne speech was, a, was that all civil servants would be trained in brain study certification, which is fabulous because that talks about um, providing trauma-informed care, what trauma-informed care means, why it matters, and the impacts of childhood trauma on the brain lifelong, because these are lifelong impacts. When you've experienced a trauma, part of your brain stops developing at that age. So if you have experienced a trauma at the age of three years old, part of your brain will never develop fully beyond that. Yet we look at an, uh, someone that appears to be an adult and expect them to be full functioning. We pay no attention to the fact that this person has aspects of their brain who are still operating at a three-year-old level. And if, like, if we just did that well, if we just invested our money in accessibility supports and, and or health wherever we want to put access to, to mental health care for children, wherever we want to put that, oh, I don't care, just put it in. Because that one small act, it would be like having access to cancer treatment when in the right moment. Having access to good cancer treatment, you, are, your you go through it, your body heals, you come out on the other end healthy. This is like a growing cancer when we don't treat these things in children. And they grow up to unable to be functional adults, which means we're paying for it. We're paying for it in our justice system, in our health care system. We're paying for it in all kinds of ways. Whereas if we would just put the money in investment in early intervention and prevention, in health care access, mental health care access for everyone on the age spectrum, to, from, from pediatrics to, to our young children and everyone in between. That is a good investment that will save us money in the end. We will have healthier adults, healthier economy, healthier workplaces, healthier health care system, healthier justice system, and the list goes on and on. Um, when we consider the amount of crises that we are facing right now, we know that 
when there's a housing crisis, opioid usage and addiction skyrockets. So of course we're finding all of these social issues. We are in a housing crisis. If we don't connect all of these dots and recognize how one, thing's impact, how one thing can impact another, we're missing the mark. This all comes back to the social determinants of health, what we need to be healthy. And one of the things that I was reminded of as I was listening to the, the two members speak was about loneliness. One of the things we do in our publicly owned housing is conduct surveys that ask people, are you lonely? And 90, does anyone remember the number? 90 some percent of the people in public housing say yes, 90 percent. As a result of similar um, experiences in Britain, they have a ministry, ministry for loneliness. That's how big this is. And universal health care, I would even expand to say, some things, some, for some people, all they need to have positive mental health outcomes is somebody there, somebody to talk to, someone to say hi, somebody who sees them, someone who can give them a hug. Because we've got people completely suffering in silence where all they need is a person. They don't need mental health interventions. They just need someone there. And so how do we engage the community here too? That's another, another really big aspect here. And one of the things that I meant to say in the very beginning, and I, I'm conscious I don't want to talk too long because I'm really curious to hear what others have to say, is from the Peachy Report. And they, this definition I'm just going to read. Mental health is a state of well-being in which the individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to his or her own community. That is exactly what universal health care would do for us as a province. And I just cannot imagine having an argument against this. And I really, with that, of course, I support this motion. And I look forward to hearing what others have to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Could I have the podium, First of all, I want to say thank you to the members from the opposition for this motion. Our government has worked to ensure robust mental health programming and supports are provided in locations across the island, while also collaborating with community partners to provide optimal, person-centered mental health supports to all islanders. We recognize the need, and we have worked to develop supports that can be accessed from anywhere island-wide including the Mental Health and Addiction Access Line at 1-833-553-6983. This 24-7 phone line has provided over 4,300 Islanders with access to this free service. We have also implemented um, mobile mental health response teams who go to the location of the caller to provide care within the community. Um, it's important to note that these vans, again, we talked about stigma with mental health, that these vans are nondescript, um, they can't be identified. Uh, where in the past, where maybe the police services were called, um, we might have, people might be reluctant to reach out. So some of the numbers I passed along in the legislature um, a couple days ago, and I've had an update for the first quarter of this year, and those numbers are increasing. So I did have some concerns about that, but um, the response from the department was, that's, made, that's probably a good thing. This is upstream. This is uh, early in, in a crisis where they reach out to get help that may help us in the future. So um, the numbers are increasing, but I think it, again, is back to the line um, um, and its awareness and the awareness of the service. So it, it's, it's a good thing that when people need help, that they can reach out to those units. These teams also provide follow-up to Islanders who have been seen in the emergency department to check, to check in, provide further assistance and support, and connect to available community services. In 2022, I believe it was over 1,000 people that actually, after they were discharged, 
those teams would follow up with them to ensure that they were aware of community supports and that they needed additional help. As of June 1st, 2023, we have made changes to the provincial drug program, which reduces co-pays to $5 for commonly prescribed eligible mental health medi medications. Additionally, one year ago, we implemented the substance use harm reduction program, which provides six medications for opiate and alcohol misuse at no charge to island residents. To date, more than 1,100 islanders have accessed the program, saving over $1 million in out-of-pocket costs. Both of these drug program, bro, programs ensure medications focused on mental health and substance misuse are provided at no cost or minimal cost and will result in better health come for islanders. We implemented two mental health programs over the past few months. First, we worked to design and open the structured mental health day and residential program, providing 20-day treatment spaces and eight residential spaces for clients who require mental health supports and psychoeducational programming, including coping and life skills. In response to the need to assist islanders who do not want or require an acute care admission, Health PEI created the new Mental Health Intensive Day Treatment Program. This four-week program provides intensive care, individual care planning, and group programming to islanders. Upon receiving feedback from participants, it has been deemed a, a very significant success. The emergency department and short stay unit adjacent to the QEH emergency room began construction in July of 2022 and is on schedule to, hope to open late in 2023 or early 2024. This will provide a more appropriate avenue for Islanders to access both mental health and psychiatric assistance. The new Mental Health and Addictions Acute Care Hospital slash Life Skills Center and the Mental Health and Addictions Wellness and Transition Center have recently completed design and I'm proud to say it will be soon out to tender. Our government pledged support to help Islanders in their homes and communities with a $3.2 million introduction of the flex, Flexible Assertive Community Treatment, or FACT teams. These teams will be composed of multidisciplinary professionals and support staff who assist individuals in safely managing their mental health concerns in the community. They do have different staffing models um, that include such things as OTs um, in comparison to our mobile mental health units. So there is a different complement of professionals that will um, work on those fact teams. Ensuring programs and services exist for Islanders is only one part of the equation. One of the most beneficial important services on, the, on offer is that of the mental health patient navigator who assists Islanders seeking mental health and addiction supports to navigate their way through the health care system. The navigator can also provide additional community supports when needed and does so in a very time efficient manner, manner. We do have excellent community agencies that provide support to Islanders and as a department, we work to assist Peers Alliance, Canadian Mental Health Association, Lennon House and our, and our landing place to offer programming in the community. Our primary goal is the well-being of all and we know government cannot do it all so we rely heavily on the amazing work of, non, of non-governmental organizations in our community. We are proud to support new and innov innovative initiatives that to support the mental well-being for Islanders in the community. Canadian Mel Mental Health Association, for instance, has successfully integrated trained peer support workers, and this is an initiative that I believe provides value, and then one that we can try to further expand upon. The Alliance for Mental, Health, Mental Wellbeing is a newer organization that provides funding to community groups island-wide who work to promote, enhance, and maintain Islanders' well-being. Community groups are able to apply under various funding streams with a focus being on developing and broadening the resiliency of Islanders. This motion raises an important point and, and one that I'm hopeful everyone understands. Anyone who needs mental health support should find it available and accessible, either in the community or virtually. Access to virtual mental health programs supports has been steadily increasing as it is seen as a way for Islanders to connect with professionals without leaving the comfort of their home. For example, Bridge the Gap acts as an online directory and connector 
where users can browse mental health and substance, uh, substance use resources, sign up for online programming, use evidence-based tools, and find services. This education and programming, again, can be at the user's convenience and time frame, which further places the individual first. Madam Speaker, I hope I have shown that our province works to make sure mental health care is available and accessible to all Islanders. We have developed great initiatives through our Department of Health, through our Department and Health PEI, and have been able to support and utilize excellent programming in the community. Mental health supports are not one size fits all approach. What works for one may not necessarily work for someone else. We are working tirelessly to ensure that there are programs and services to meet Islanders where they are at in their journey. This motion is an important reminder that we should always strive to improve and strengthen that we care, the, the care that we offer to Islanders. I want to thank the movers of this motion, and I will be supporting it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Is there anyone else to speak to the motion? Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I've really enjoyed listening to the debate in the House this afternoon. I want to thank the member from Charlottetown West Royalty for bringing forward this really, really important motion. Um, the World Health Organization defines health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. It's a very positive definition. And you'll note that of the three components of health, of well-being, uh, mental health and well-being are there, physical, mental, and social well-being. And I love that the World Health Organization understands, well, if anybody should understand, it should be the, wealth, the World Health Organization, but emphasizes in their definition that health involves all of our being. Um, and I really appreciate the fact that this motion zeroes in on that that if we are to provide health serve, if we as a province are to provide comprehensive health services for all islanders then we have to provide comprehensive mental health services for all islanders um, i appreciated listening to the minister and the various programs that currently exist and there are many and uh, indeed uh, there are some services that prince edward island offers currently and that Islanders take advantage of, but we still have many gaps. I often think of the universal health care system, or what we like to consider to be the universal health care system here in Canada, as working until you get to the neck. And then pretty much everything above the neck, there's not a lot of supports, whether that's your teeth, although we've made some strides in that here, whether it's your eyes. Um, uh, eye care and the provision of glasses and testing and all of the things is not something that's part of our universal health care system. Hearing aids, again, your ears are not there, and your brain. Um, when it comes to our universal so-called health care system, there is so much that is not covered, and uh, access to good, comprehensive, well-funded mental health supports, and here I'm talking primarily about talk therapy because that is the sort of that is where most people derive benefit when they're struggling mentally there are of course other things one can do and the minister mentioned the five dollar copay for uh, certain medications including some which are helpful for people who are suffering from anxiety or depression and those are all very useful but if we are looking for real long-term solutions that will benefit individuals to reach that state of complete mental well-being, then we have to be talking about funding talk therapy. There's a big cost involved in that, of course, um, significant cost. But let's not forget about the costs of not providing this, the human costs, and we all know within our families, I would imagine there are not many families on Prince Edward Island who are not touched by serious mental health issues. Um, I know my own, that is true. And I know very few people for whom there is not somebody somewhere in their immediate or extended family who suffers from mental health challenges. Not surprising given that one in three Canadians 
during the course of their lifetime will suffer from mental health uh, concerns. And of course, that can range from everywhere from the mild, um, well, I shouldn't say mild, from, from transient anxieties and depressions to serious um, psychotic uh, mental illnesses. And if we are to provide the universal mental health care that this motion calls for, and which I absolutely support, then it's going to cost money. But again, let's not forget that there are costs in inaction, severe costs, not just from a human point of view, but to our economy and to families. And investments, good, smart investments in mental health can keep people well. They can keep them in the workforce. They can allow people to contribute to the fullest possible capacity that they have as individuals to our communities and to our economy. And it is estimated that every dollar spent on mental health returns four dollars, somewhere between four and ten dollars to the economy. That's, that's an extraordinary statistic. And it speaks to the fact that yes, this is a cost, but it is also in very real terms an investment. It's an investment primarily in people, it's an investment that will get, that will see returns economically as well for, for our province. PEI has the highest rate of any province for child and youth hospitalizations due to mental disorders. That's a, that's a pretty shocking thing to say. And it's not just youth. Um, that, and by the way, that's been the case for the last six or seven years. PEI also has the highest rate of any province for adult hospitalizations due to mental disorders as well. Now, of course, any time you're comparing Prince Edward Island statistics with the rest of the country, we have to be cognizant of the fact that we are a small sample group here. But that's been a pretty consistent number for many, many years now. And that is of concern. That suggests to me, because anybody who is suffering to the extent that one has to to actually be taken into hospital because of your mental health challenges. That is somebody who could have received mental health supports earlier in their journey and not ended up in hospital. It's a sign to me that of a system that is failing islanders. And again, to come back to the motion, to provide universal health care for all islanders. If we do that, not only are we serving islanders well, but we are going to take some of the strain <coughs> off our hospitals and we are going to provide an economic stimulus. Improving access to treatments for depres depression, for example, have been estimated to, to boost the, the national economy here in a, an enormous way. And again, to me, that's almost a secondary thing. It's watching people not suffer from anxiety and depression. Um, which is, for me, the big payback here. It's not an economic thing. It's, it's, it's a personal thing. And so many of those costs and hospitalizations could be avoided if we had universal mental health and substance abuse care. Um, if all islanders could access counseling and therapy for free, we could potentially avoid their mental health conditions worsening to the point where they need to get um, critical intervention. Sorry. All the hour. Yeah. The hour has been called. Honourable Member, could you close debate with the seconder? Madam Speaker, I adjourn debate, seconded by the member from Victoria, uh, Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Okay. The Honourable Member from Kensington, Malpeck, and Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, secondly, by Charlottetown Belvedere, that this House do adjourn until Wednesday, June 7th, at 1 p.m. Talk, Gary.